As my dad is finishing his last few days of treatment and rehab, I went to the facility he's in to visit him for Father's Day. Up until a few days ago, he was in a facility in Jamestown for several months. It's next to the North Dakota State Hospital, and somehow we started talking about paranormal stuff and his experiences there. So, a short history on this hospital is that it opened in 1885 and became an institution for the mentally ill and criminally insane. Within the next couple of years, overcrowding became a, a huge problem, so the hospital was forced to expand multiple times while also being severely understaffed. In 1937, the governor fired the institution's superintendent and 75% of the staff and rehired new people in their place because of their political contributions. After this, the new staff were very underqualified to care for the patients and treated them badly by cussing at and abusing them. And probably killing some too. By 1949, the news of overcrowding, neglect, malnutrition, seclusion, and on and on hit the newspapers, and by 1953, reforms started happening and things started to get better. By 1974, the population dropped from 2,000 in the 1940s to about 600 and about 200 today. And yes, the place is still in operation. Today, the hospital now serves as a place for psychiatric services, transitional living, and treatment for chemical dependency. So, my dad liked to stay busy over there, so he would always take jobs or help out in any way that he could. From my understanding, the hospital was a, a kind of like a, a partner institution to this rehab place. But the people there were more like inmates, whereas he could live and have much more freedom. He went to the side of the hospital that acts as a prison today and helped one of the ladies who works there with the laundry. They folded a ton of sheets and towels and went downstairs for something and when they came back, the sheets were thrown all over the floor and they were all messed up. But keep in mind that everything there stays locked so there was no way that somebody could have been there to do that. The lady told my dad that it was Charlie, the ghost in that part of the prison, Apparently, he does this kind of stuff all the time. The lady told my dad that they have different names for ghosts all around the prison because there's so many there. They even have a few rooms that they had to block off because any time a resident or inmate would move into them, they would refuse to go back because so much creepy shit would happen and they would just end up having to move them to a different room. Even the old warden's office was so haunted that he told them if they couldn't find him a new space for his stuff that he was going to quit his job and move on. And my dad said that apparently things would move all around and go flying off the shelves and stuff. Since he was able to leave frequently and have a job outside the facility while he was there, he and a couple of guys took a local job doing weed whipping or other lawn stuff on the hospital grounds in the cemetery. He was working with a, a small crew of guys in the middle of the afternoon. The part of the hospital grounds they were working on is no longer in operation, but the building they were by had a lot of windows, so you can see everything inside. And he and the other guy saw someone walking around in there. So they let their boss know that someone else was working there too. But his boss said that nobody's been working in there for years and that nobody can get inside. They joked around about seeing a ghost and came to learn that paranormal activity is super common there. My dad is a, a no bullshit kind of guy, but he and the other guys saw him so clearly that they could see his clothes and everything. They even asked each other, did you see what he was wearing? And one of the guys that was working with my dad in a super scared voice said, yeah, and someone's screwing with us. And that was a person. But... They just kept working, even though they were creeped out. But then, they saw him again. My dad said the same apparition came walking really fast down the hallway towards them, and they could still see into the window and darted around the corner into the garage. He was wearing a, an old-timer's black and white suit with a hat to go with it, and he kept his head down like he was trying to hide his face from them or something. The guy with my dad took off running and said that he was done working there because he was so scared. But my dad yelled at him to run to the front and they could catch the guy who was trying to freak them out. They went around to all the possible doors and absolutely nobody was there. Somehow, the boss ended up getting the keys so that they could investigate in that part and my dad said that it was so dusty in there that they would have seen footprints. 
And the only footprints in there were their own. There was zero trace of the man they saw. My dad, who remember is a no-nonsense kind of guy, told me that he's convinced for a fact that the place is haunted as hell. But the way my dad described the whole event always gives me chills. My dad said that the guy must have been doing something shady because he just kept ducking away from us and hiding his face. I know it sounds strange, but it almost sounds like he was toying with them. My grandparents were really old-fashioned, so when I stayed with them as a child, I was kept on a tight schedule. Even if I was crying, they kept me locked in my room, at their attic. My parents were out on a trip, so I was staying with my grandparents, and sure enough, I started crying and was left there. No one was coming for me, which made me cry even more, and that's when a young woman in a, a sunflower dress put a hand on me and began to hum. I fell back to sleep quickly, and of course, that memory could be anything since I was around two or three, but I think it's worth mentioning given the following. I had a, an imaginary friend growing up, and his name was Lee. He was an old man who loved to dance, but was sad because his wife had left him. Late at night, he would come into my room and dance toward music, mostly jazz. He would tell me stories every once in a while about his favorite coffee shop and other weird life stories. My dad thought seven-year-old me was imaginative, but my mother called a priest to bless the house, and after that, I never saw Lee again. But things were quiet for a while, and nothing odd happened. My mum cancelled a few vacations here and there because of dreams she had where one of us died on said trip, and that got annoying, but she had some weird stuff and predicted the future events before, so we just kind of listened to her. My family is also very heavily invested in rodeo, and my dad is a rancher and my mum a barrel racer and so on. I was with my little brother, who would have been five and I about ten at the time, and we were sitting on the top of the bleachers watching my mum compete. And my brother and I, we were tickling each other or something, and I pushed him off the bleachers by accident. Which, the fall was not massive, but for a five-year-old falling 70 feet, it was not all that peachy. I was freaking out and then this woman walks up to me and she smiles and hands me a Dr. Pepper. She says that I caught him and he's just sleeping. It freaked me out but sure enough my brother was fine, just out cold from the fall. And I have no idea where the lady went after that so I'm not sure what the hell that was all about but it was strange. Now there was this mirror in the downstairs bathroom of my house. It gave me bad vibes, so I avoided going down there all the time. But on the days that I did go down there, I would look the other way and just try to get out of there as soon as possible. But one time, I stared into it trying to overcome my fear, but I was met by um, an older lady staring back at me. I stood there for what felt like hours, unable to move. In fact, my mum found me and shook me out of my trance. It's a weird memory, but it's the main reason I dislike mirrors today. My family also bought a piece of land in the Gila National Forest from a, a practicing witch. On a side note, we actually found a stash of coke, so yeah, that was fun. But she performed sacrifices and did odd rituals on the property before we moved there. A lot of things happened there too, all starting with my dog digging up animal bones. And then... Everyone started hearing voices just passing the dark tree lines at night. We were remodeling the little huts and the shack she built around the property when things really started to pick up. I was left alone in the camper van that we were staying in due to the remodel when something knocked at the door. I opened it to find nothing. I look around and see something dark with red eyes behind one of the trees. It could have been my imagination, but I could have sworn that I heard it say that we come from the mines. Obviously, though, I was totally freaked out and I just locked myself in the camper and called my parents. 
Another side note, the property is now a rental and a weird hermit claimed to see the same thing behind trees with no knowledge of my stories or previous tenants. He moved and apparently a monk refused to step foot on the property due to a bad energy coming off of it. Also, while remodeling, we wanted to donate a bunch of tiles that we salvaged from the floor in the witch's house, shacks, and a Catholic nun refused to accept them due to their energy again. I know this is all really weird stuff, but I'm just telling you all this because, yeah, it'll happen to me. But something that the monster said stuck with me. The part about coming from the mines? I actually explored a lot of the back ends of those woods, but nothing will ever compare to when I found the empty field. Imagine for a second, wandering through dense woods and stumbling onto something about the size of a, a football field with nothing on it but a boulder dead center into it. This was a town site for an abandoned mine apparently, and on the other side of the field was the Cleveland mine site, abandoned in the 1800s. But this little piece of land is a hidden gem in New Mexico. Old stone towers, staircases leading nowhere, and an old dam holding water. But the weirdest part were the holes though. There were holes and caverns that went on forever, leading into darkness and all I could think of was whatever the monster I saw was, it came from here for sure. I mean, we heard all sorts of odd noises coming from those holes, but I never fully explored them due to the danger of the caves collapsing and we moved far away from there soon after. Things went quiet again after that until I started going to a private Christian school out of an old Baptist church. The school had a, a massive basement more like a labyrinth if I'm being honest, and some of my friends and I were messing around down there. And then, some really weird stuff started happening after this girl tried to get her best friend to do some ritual of some sort down there. The pre-K fifth graders heard a, a woman singing about morbid things. The Spanish teacher heard every door open and close repeatedly in the early morning, even though she was the only one there. I threw a ball down a long hallway and something threw it back. The pastor came in and blessed the place and the police showed up to look for homeless squatting in the area a few times and it was just really weird. Things have been quiet lately but my mother still sees shadowy figures move around our house apparently at night but she seems to think that they're friendly or something. Anyway, these are all my stories and to be honest with you, I really don't understand any of this at all, but I just wanted to share some of my stories with you guys. In 1990, my parents took me and my four-year-old brother on a vacation to the French Alps, where they had rented a little cottage for a week. I was only two at the time, so this is all based on my parents' recollection, so bear with me. Pretty much as soon as we settled in the cottage, my mum was hit with a, a gut feeling that something was just not right. She felt very anxious and on edge, and that feeling only intensified as the days went by. At first, my parents tried to convince themselves that it was all in their heads. But then, strange things started happening. Red stains were appearing and then randomly disappearing all over the cottage. The second day, my dad bit into an apple and there was red liquid at the core of the apple. Bright red liquid, dripping from the apple. He spit out the apple and never found a, a logical explanation. They also heard knocking and creaking at random times of the day and night. Not that weird in an old cottage, but still, it gave everyone the creeps. My mum kept on feeling worse and worse as time went on too. She said that she felt physically sick being inside the cottage, in fact. She's always been very intuitive, and her gut was telling her to just get the hell out of there. That something didn't want us there. On the fourth night, though, my parents, they both woke up in a jolt and felt intense, undescribable, and unexplainable fear at exactly the same time. My brother and I, we were apparently crying and yelling in the next room. My mum begged my dad to go and they packed and we got the hell out of there. But my mum said that as we were leaving and walking down the hallway, red stains appeared all over the walls and floor. 
and by the time that we reached the door, everyone was pretty much running. But when my dad turned around to close the door, he said that the red stains had disappeared again. My parents had both had encounters before. Our house itself is very old and was even used as a makeshift hospital during World War I. My mum always surprises me because she's usually so calm when she talks about this stuff. When I still lived at our house, I would sometimes hear footsteps in the yard in the middle of the night, when all the doors were locked too. When I still lived at our house, I would sometimes hear footsteps in the middle of the night when all the doors in our house were locked. When I asked my mum if she had gone for a midnight stroll, she would calmly tell me that it must have been one of the ghosts that she had seen before. I know, it sounds crazy, but I promise she's not. Anyway, the one time that she does get dead serious is if I ever bring up our vacation in the Alps. To this day, her voice still gets shakes when she talks about it, and I can honestly see the fear in her eyes. So... Back to the story. My parents contacted the man who had rented the cottage to them and told him that they left the premises earlier than planned. They were so shaken by the whole experience that they couldn't help but ask if anything had ever happened in that cottage before. And, to their surprise, the man opened up about it. He said my parents were definitely not the first vacationers to report strange happenings there. After they questioned him a bit more, he finally revealed that apparently there had been a murder-suicide in the cottage in the early 80s. A man killed his wife and kids and then hung himself in the attic. For starters, I'm a 17-year-old girl from Colorado. I'm white and I don't have a lick of Native American blood in me, but... I don't think that that really matters for this. And my dad's side of the family all have farms in Minnesota, built on land that was heavily populated by Native Americans well over a century ago. We know this because we've honestly found boxes on top of boxes of Native American artifacts, including tons of arrows and spearheads, ceremonial jewelry and pottery shards, tapping stones and heaps more. And every year during spring planting... The tractors bring up even more. We have experienced paranormal happenings on our land, but I'm only there so often, so I've only experienced a, a very small handful of things that I couldn't really explain away. But for the most part, while I am a Christian and a believer of the paranormal and supernatural, I like to try and find logical explanations to things. I'm often very curious, and it takes a lot to scare me. I mean, I've been through enough crap already to have lost most of my fear, but this year especially has been testing on all levels. So, I had to fly back to Minnesota, which is where I really call home, the Wednesday after Memorial Day because my grandpa passed away on Memorial Day morning. His death honestly shocked us all. He was stubborn and strong and despite his disabilities and illnesses... He always pulled through when he got sick and was determined to return to the farm. But I guess that he just couldn't take it anymore and passed away peacefully at home, surrounded by his wife and kids. He wanted all of his grandkids, including myself, to be at his funeral, so I flew in as soon as possible, leaving my life responsibilities in Colorado. And my mum was nice enough to come with me, even though my parents divorced when I was a toddler and she just stayed at a hotel and out of the way for the most part, even though we invited her to Grandpa's wake and funeral and all. My mum just wanted me to connect with my Minnesota family more than ever. So, the night of the day I flew in, my aunt offered to take me to my Uncle A's place for something to do. And my Uncle A just lives a quarter mile up the road from my grandma's farm or across the field from it. In fact, my grandma's farm is visible from Uncle A's house and I could easily walk to and from the houses. But when I got there, my uncle almost immediately gave me a 22 caliber rifle and a Mountain Dew soda and complained to me about his growing blackbird problem. He said that he'd give me a buckbird, so I agreed to go out there and shoot. It was getting dark and the sights on the rifle were off, so I didn't get anything at all except for leaves in the sky. If the sights on the rifle were good, 
I would have made five bucks that night, at least. My uncle had found this other 22 rifle with the good sights, but by then it was way too dark to differentiate the blackbirds from the robins, and it's illegal to shoot robins in the state of Minnesota. So, to pass the time, my uncle set up a pyramid of old soda and beer cans, and also balanced a few gallon cups on a gallon of laundry detergent for us to shoot at. My little cousins came out soon too with their bows and BB guns, so my uncle and I would take turns showing the boys how to shoot their weapons and fired our twenty twos as well. We were having a really good time, and I had almost forgotten the main reason why I was in Minnesota in the first place. My cousins had gone down to the basement walkout where my aunt and uncle's wife were sitting, and meanwhile, my uncle and I continued shooting our twenty twos when my uncle suddenly commanded me to stop shooting. He was tracking something with his finger. My uncle said under his breath, what the hell is that? And I asked, alarmed, what is what? I squinted to see what my uncle was tracking and then I saw it. From our standpoint, we could see across many young fields over rolling hills. If you look to the left, you could see grandmas, and if you look to the right, you could see several more farms dotting the fields. If you look straight ahead, you'd see the side of a large hill with a field on it, and just ahead of that hill was a small grove of trees that also lined our property. The creature my uncle was pointing at was running parallel to the horizon, and would eventually run across that hillside, which was no more than a quarter mile away from us. And... It was hauling ass, running as fast or faster than a racehorse even. The creature was solid black, really large and slender, with a small head, extremely long and thin legs, and no visible tail. At first, we thought that it was a deer, but it was way too slender and black to be a deer. And then, I suggested that maybe it was a Great Dane, or perhaps a horse even but no one in our area has a black Great Dane or any big black dog at all for that matter. Nor does anyone have a black horse, and the way that this creature was running, it didn't look like either of those two. It was about the size of a horse though, but it ran a bit like a deer with a spring in its step. It had a hunched back and legs that were long and skinny like twigs, and its head was pretty small. In fact... It kind of looked like a greyhound, but much larger, and it looked a bit distorted and twisted too. I don't really know how to explain it better than that, but I just knew that this thing was really weird. I could tell that the front of it was larger than its back, like the rib cage jutted out a bit, and while its front legs were almost like long human arms, its back legs were like a deer's, only a bit meatier than that and its hip bone seemed to jut out a little bit like uh, an old Holstein cow. It was galloping and gaining speed like it was on the hunt or something, but we didn't see what it was hunting down. I didn't get nervous until it banked our way and charged into the thin line of trees separating our property from the neighbors. This line was two trees thick at the most, and the trees were oak trees, no older than 20 years. We definitely should have been able to see this thing stop, especially since it was no more than 300 feet away when it ran into the trees. But we didn't see nor hear anything. Plus, even when it came close, other than its size, there was nothing very clear about it. It was just slender, long-legged, puny-headed, and didn't have any visible tail. My uncle's wife suddenly called our attention, asking what the hell we were seeing and said that we were scaring my little cousins. My uncle described it just as I did and I confirmed it because she thought that we were bullshitting. My uncle and I stayed in our places, our rifles loaded and ready and stared at those trees for a good 10 minutes, occasionally glancing at each other and saw nothing exit nor heard anything move. It was a, a windless quiet night too, so... We could hear almost everything, including the cows nearly a mile away. It's probably needless to say, but we were both pretty freaked out, and I spent some time on my phone that night, looking up various things to see if I could come up with a rational explanation for what we saw. But I found nothing. 
except for skinwalker stories and descriptions, which, if I'm being honest, fit the creature we saw perfectly. I've heard of skinwalkers before and many stories, but never really believed they existed. Even if they did, I thought that they were only in the southwestern states, but I guess that they can appear anywhere. So, what do you guys think? I'm open to possible explanations, similar experiences, and other ideas. I don't usually share paranormal stories, but what happened that Wednesday night will definitely stick with me. When I first left home after graduation, I moved half a state away from my family home. I was working two jobs and studying and I ended up renting a room off this woman. And originally she seemed really normal. But a few weeks in, she decided to tell me that she's a witch. That she and her coven go run around naked each full moon in the mountains. I didn't particularly care because, meh, everyone has their hobbies, right? Though I did end up leaving because she was stealing off of me causing conflict, killing my pet fish, and started to do creepy stuff such as, on several occasions, I would wake up in the night to find her standing in the doorway just standing there staring at me. Anyway, I moved out and she wanted more money off of me. I paid rent each week until I left but she wanted another week's rent for the week it took her to find a new housemate. I told her no and not to communicate with me. But the woman stalked and harassed me for several weeks after until I had to get the police involved. Later in my new place, I started occasionally waking up in the night to see something standing in the corner of my room. It would appear there and then just vanish, so I assumed it was a dream and then I would just go back to sleep. Over the course of a few weeks, I would wake up and find the thing was moving closer and closer to my bed whenever I saw it. It would vanish though and I would go back to sleep. During this time, I started developing unexplainable scratches all over my body too, except my face. At first, I thought that the scratches were probably something caused by bumping into things at work or home. Over time though, I just kept developing scratches more and more, even on places on my back where I couldn't reach and around my neck. Meanwhile, the thing that appeared in my room at night started taking on a, a female-looking form. People tried to tell me that it was a case of sleep paralysis, but I could easily move and talk. One night, though, I woke up because I couldn't breathe and it felt like a pair of hands were around my neck. And I woke up to find it standing above me and smiling. As soon as I opened my eyes, it vanished and... I then didn't have any issues until a week or so later. I usually sleep in the dark, but there was a light from the main parts of the house that shined through via under the door. Also the side gaps which made it so that I could see things in my room. And the last time that I ever saw this thing was one night when I rolled onto my side. I felt some air blow into my face, but I ignored it and then I felt another one blow into my face. I opened my eyes and... I came face to face with this thing that all I can describe as is looked like a, a rotten woman. It was like a woman died and was left in a body of water for several days or something. The hair was slimy, her face was bloated and her eyes puffed closed from swelling but she was looking at me I think. Her chin was propped up on the bed while the rest of her was angled under the bed. After staring at this abomination for a few seconds, I quickly sat up and it just vanished. But after that, I was way too scared to get out of bed and I had to wait until morning to do anything. It was the last time that I saw it and I no longer get scratches on my body, but I have to wonder that if any of this is linked to that witch I pissed off. I'm a 20-year-old female university student from Australia and this experience happened last year in the winter of 2017. 
I had moved several hours away from my hometown for uni and I was looking to earn some money whilst I was studying. During high school, I'd been a school tutor and I really enjoyed tutoring and I thought that this would be a good way to continue, so I went about finding students to tutor. It wasn't long before a mother contacted me asking about getting tutoring for her son. I'm not exactly sure of his age as she only told me his year level and I can't remember if I ever asked how old he was, but I think that he would have been around 9 or 10 we agreed to do the tutoring regardless at their house and we arranged a time to meet for that week. On the arranged day, I drove to their house for our first session. It was the usual first meeting. The mother was lovely and her son was very cooperative, if a little quiet. When you're a tutor, all you want is a student who will try hard and listen to your instructions. And this student was perfectly well behaved. Their house was a, a small cottage-like house, but it was really neat. We worked at the kitchen table and the dining room, which formed an L-shape with the living room. The entranceway was in the corner formed by the two rooms. Off the dining room or entrance corner was the student's room. The door was shut, but I could tell by the decorative name placard on the door that it was his. If this door was open, he would have been able to see straight into the living room. So, the first few weeks of tutoring went along fine. I was really happy to work with this student and his mother, but a few weeks in, I started noticing that the student just wasn't himself. He seemed really tired and wasn't as responsive to my instructions. Not in a disobedient way, just like he couldn't concentrate properly or something. I brushed it off at first because it was winter and cold and towards the end of term two which is typically a long term in Australian schooling. This is when students started to get sick and run down, so it wasn't that unusual for my students to seem a little tired at this time of year. So we had a two week break over the school holidays and I hoped that after this that he would be well rested and ready to start again. During our first session after the holidays, however, he seemed even more tired. I could barely get him to follow any instructions and he was taking much longer to complete work than expected. In fact, it got so bad that I stopped the session momentarily and asked him if everything was okay. Was he feeling okay or was he having any problems with the work at school? I didn't want to pry too much with his mother in the room but I knew I wasn't getting anywhere just plowing ahead when he clearly wasn't keeping up. Up until this stage, this is probably the most boring story you'll ever have heard being told. And that was, until the student replied, I can't sleep. Before I could say anything, he continued. And he said, in the dark, a lady in a white dress crawls out of the clock. And I can see her from my room and I'm scared to sleep because I know if I close my eyes, she'll get me. He points to the grandfather clock in the living room, which is on the right angle to be seen from the student's bedroom, and now I'm thinking, okay, that's creepy. Crawls. Not walks, but crawls out from the clock. I asked him as calmly as I could, have you been watching any scary movies or reading any scary stories lately? I'm thinking that this kid has seen or read something creepy and then had a nightmare about it or simply has an active imagination, but he just shook his head. At the end of the session, I mentioned this to his mother as I was concerned by how distressed he seemed. And it was her response that really shocked me though. She said, yes, I've heard strange noises coming from the living room. We've only recently got that clock and it's really old. Someone inherited it and then when they died their children sold it and I bought it and that's as much as I know. I monitor everything he watches and he doesn't watch or look up anything remotely scary like that. I don't know where this fear has come from or what to do about it but honestly it scares me a little too. At this point, I don't know what to think. I put it in the back of my mind until... The next time I see him. And nothing more is said about the woman and the student seems to have finally gotten a little more sleep so as far as I'm concerned all is good. But about five weeks later I'm at their house again and 
The weather is absolutely disgusting. The gale force winds and lots of heavy rain with lightning. It's a little early in the year for a storm here, but it's a pretty bad one. About 40 minutes into the session, the power goes out, and the only light source is the flashing of the lightning that can be seen through the living room window. The mother comes out to check on us, but at this point, there isn't much to do. We wait a couple of minutes, but the power just never comes back. The mother suggests that we just call it a night and that she'll just pay me for the full amount seeing as we were almost finished anyway. As I'm packing up to leave, there's a giant flash of lightning and I hear the mother gasp. I look up and I swear to you that I saw the hem of a white lace dress drag across the floor in front of the grandfather clock and into the shadows. And well, I wasted no time getting out to my car that night. The whole event really chilled me to the bone too because I've never really believed in ghosts before this but now I'm not so sure. And the creepy thing is, if what I saw was real then perhaps this boy really is seeing a woman crawling out of his clock. When I was younger, I would go visit my grandma down in Mexico in Durango and the municipality of Canatlan. She was the only reason we went there and it was a nice little house that faced a hill and it was more like a long stretch mountain that spread into a forest kind of area. I have stories of that too, but I digress. The front door led to the main room and connected to it was another smaller room on the back left. In that room were two doors. One was the main room and the other was on the right wall that led to the kitchen. The kitchen wasn't very big, it stretched out from the door. The width was only about 7 to 8 feet. At the end of the kitchen though was a door that led outside. Behind the house, the backyard was fenced and led a, a slanted angle down to a river. There was also tall grass everywhere and this whole thing stretched 200 feet, maybe a little more. This is all important, or at least relevant to the story ahead. So, my grandma was the sweetest, food-making, hug kind of grandma that you could ever have, and she loved telling me stories about the weird differing things that she had seen and stories passed down by my ancestors. My mum's side of the family is Native American. And I was nine when she told me the story of a, a demon that would follow this river behind the house, and that every few years, it would go the length of this river. I, of course, being the kid that I was, took this as a, a crazy story to entertain me. And this is what she told me. Apparently, the demon doesn't seek anyone out or go out of its way to kill someone, say, overlooking the river from a distance. But on occasion, it would come to houses and stay in an empty room, only wishing to not be disturbed. But once she said this, her demeanor changed completely. She put her hand on my shoulders and met my eyes and said this in Spanish. You have one chance and one only. You have one chance and one only. If you ever walk into an empty room in the dark and it's abnormally black in an area or see the silhouette of a black and red thing, simply leave the room and close the door. Do not open the door until the next morning. If you disturb the demon or return to it, it will without hesitation kill you or drag you to the river. As she said this, her voice was filled with a sense of dread and importance. Three years later, I go back to visit my grandma, still happy, still making me food. I was there for a month as it was summer and my mum wanted to take care of my grandma as she knew that she was dying and didn't have but a year or two at most. And around week two was when it happened. It was a normal day, a beautiful one actually, lots of green this time of year, and then the night came. My grandma and my mum were sleeping in the main room, my brother, cousin and I, we were in the other room, all three sleeping on each other as the couch was just big enough. I woke up for some reason that I still can't explain, and it was just a, a lot darker than I'm used to since there were no real street lights, just the moon. And well, there was no real reason to panic. I was just out of my element a bit. 
As my eyes focused, I began to make out the door. This wasn't a normal door like the one that led to the main room. This was a, an old plank wood door with holes and cracks. And I thought that I heard some small movement in the kitchen. It wasn't totally out of ordinary for a streetcar or other animal to sneak in and move some stuff around for food or whatever, so curiosity got the better of me and I decided to look through. I was as quiet as I could possibly be, not because anything was eerie or some sort of dread feeling or anything, more for the fact that any noise was much louder or there were no cars or city noises, just silence, so I didn't want to wake people. I was on all fours looking through a small hole and I looked around and there was nothing. It just seemed kind of empty. As I turned away, I heard it. A soft, almost too calm kind of breathing. I looked again, but this time I decided to look for a longer period of time to let my eyes adjust. As I scanned the room, it seemed normal, but then... My eyes darted back to the left corner, almost like a rabbit seeing a coyote, and my stomach sunk hard. I saw something huddled in the corner. My mind told me to scream for help, but my instincts told me to not move a muscle. That is, until I heard a noise, almost like wood breaking. And then again, and as I realized what it was, the terror truly set in. I saw it move and in an instant I placed my back to the door as the cracking continued. When it stopped a red soft glow began to come through the cracks in the door. The breathing got louder but kept the same pace and when I heard the breathing my eyes darted to my brother and cousin who to my surprise were locked motionless as they faced the floor eyes wide open. I heard some wooden utensils that were hanging move and the glow with it. As this happened, I heard the door to the outside make a small creak and the glow just disappeared. I heard it move slowly through the grass and down to the river and some minutes later, we heard the dogs barking in the distance, almost as if they were being mauled or something. And that night, I fell asleep right there at the base of the door. The next morning, my grandma woke us up to make breakfast and she saw my face was completely pale. When I explained what happened, she said that I did good and to never forget the mercy this thing may or may not have shown to us that night. Now, I know some people may not believe this, but I swear to you that this happened to me and I have many more stories like this of things my grandmother warned me about that I ended up seeing or hearing around this area, but... What is even more creepy was that most of the time, I would see or hear what she would describe without me telling her beforehand. But on this occasion, it was the other way around. My crazy and mentally ill uncle also lived on the property and he would always go on about things that he saw and no one really believed him. But after that experience, I have to question, was he actually seeing some things? Oddly enough too, everyone who I've spoken to who's from this area and who's lived here a long time, they all say that they've seen stuff too. All this stuff gives me confidence that what I saw that night, it was real and not just in my head. The mountain in front of the house was always inviting and I have a story to tell about it but first here are some interesting facts. I checked with my mum today and started discussing the land my family owned. Apparently while the land is now split among the family there are acres and acres. However one of these lands was a large section of the mountain. Yes my family owned a mountain. This immediately triggered a series of questions that, while I would have wanted many more answers, I was short of time. But in her too long didn't read form, she said that it isn't based on word of mouth. She used to work on the fields that were up in the mountain when she was young. So I stopped her there and asked questions about the mountain's features to simply confirm if I was telling the truth or just talking out of my ass. But first, here is what I had confirmed. 
that the mountain was steep and dry in the direction of the house, but when you got to the top, it slanted at an angle downward. The slant was covered in brush and small trees and sand that lined lots of yellow and red rock. However, when the land flattened down like a plain, it became a, a kind of forest. The trees were not too close together but large, with thick patches of grass and bushes. After this large area, it would go back to a steep angle facing another small city. I confirmed what wildlife was there just to make sure that what I'm going to talk about wasn't anything that she'd ever seen or known to be in the area. I just wanted to know the main things to rule out. This included deer, coyotes, wolves, wild dogs and so on. After, I asked her if my grandma was ever serious about her stories and she confirmed that she indeed was, including the experiences she has had. One was relating to chains being dragged in the dirt behind her several nights in a row, to the point that it caused her to never walk home alone again. Well, in this case, it was just me and I wish it hadn't have been. My grandmother always encouraged me to be adventurous, so I decided going up the mountain was the way to go. My mum reluctantly let me go, only after she'd given me at least some basic survival gear and taken my grandma's old yet very powerful dog. But this dog wasn't like ordinary dogs too. It defended its territory viciously and it was essentially a border collie crossed with something that gave it some serious canine power. It was a good guard dog until... As far as I know, he died of natural causes while I was away some time later. He was only good at guarding, completely failed at any other dog task, and his name was Pippi. But Pippi and I started our adventure early in the morning. It took us until the sun rose above the horizon to slowly make our way up the mountain. And my goal was to explore the downward slanted area and do some scouting before attempting the forest ahead. But Pippi was more than happy doing his job keeping a perimeter around me while destroying some flowers every so often. I was flipping for rocks, looking for anything interesting to bring back, but as I flipped a, a flat yellow rock, I noticed something. It was dead silent. There was no wind, no animals. Everything was just still. And as I turned my gaze to see where Pippi was, I heard a loud snap in the direction of the forest. But... I just blinked and moved on. Nothing too out of the ordinary, right? And I mean, the dog was happily wagging his tail waiting for our next move, so I started to move around the forest, but something just seemed off. Not in a, a scary way, just in an abnormal way. But the light was not reaching too far into the forest. I know thick canopies can make the illusion of darkness, even on the brightest day, but these trees had a a decent amount of space between them. I made the conclusion that the angle of the sunlight, combined with the rising temperatures, made the air thick with moisture and was causing this illusion. And I continued to walk, my journey uneventful, or so it seemed. The more I continued to walk, though, the more the dog's eyes began to dart to me as if doubting my decisions to press on. I took it as the dog was simply worried about our distance from home than anything else, but he started to do this again, but now to the forest. He started with the darting eyes, and it got to the point where he was snapping his head in the direction of the forest, back and forth. He continued to do this until, finally, he stopped and didn't take his eyes off the forest. And now, I knew something was up. I assume this must be the end of my journey as a predator may have been stalking me this whole time. So I signal him to turn around and we began to work our way back. Every few minutes though, he would dart his head in the direction of the forest and it kept me on my toes. This attention to a potential predator was gone when we reached the area that we were at before. As my thoughts began to calm, I felt uh, an enjoyable breeze. How nice to finally cool off, I thought. But this feeling was shattered by the realization that my entire time here, I hadn't heard a single noise but the sound of my dog, myself, and the mysterious snap with no wind up until now. I took one last look at the forest to appreciate its beauty, but I knew better. I took note of the wind's direction. It's not totally unusual to have sudden gusts of wind and breezes from random directions up here. However, 
This was no ordinary breeze. As I walk to and from different areas and directions, I notice the wind is headed in one direction, the forest. Now, I was more intrigued than anything, and I was convinced that the most likely explanation was a dry hot pressure system was above the mountain, forcing cool air to the center where the forest just so happens to be. I asked Pippi if he could still see anything, and he responded with a waggy tail and a saggy tongue. So, sure, but why not trust the dog's opinion? I mean, he'd been right so far. We both walked to the edge of the forest, and the same darkness was there, but I could make out where the tree seemed to open up again. My only goal at this point was to cross that dark part and face my unrealistic fears. I wasn't an idiot, and if anything had been waiting for me, this dog would charge. I mean, he'd killed coyotes for fun before, and I had also been taught by my uncle at a young age to learn how to fight dogs and large wild cats and whatnot. I had locked down dogs with ease and killed a coyote and a wolf in self-defense. Not that I'd ever hurt a dog for no reason at all, but anyway, you get the idea. So, with mine made up, I walked into the forest and there was nothing. No dread and no morbid feeling. The bushes were a bit annoying, but I made it past the darkness and feeling proud and strong, I inspected what I called a, a taunting forest. I turned to face the direction that I came from, and there, I saw Pippi, at the edge of the forest. He hadn't come with me, and I somehow didn't realize it. Still, glad, I smiled at him, but as I looked closer, a thought raced to my head. The sun should at least be close to 10am, but there was no reflection in his eyes, no light and no forest. As this thought set in, I saw his body language change, and in an instant, he puffed up and showed his teeth. My stomach sank, and before I could think anything else, I ran like a man clinging to the last string of life. As I ran, though, I could have sworn that I saw the darkness follow my every step all around me. It seemed to be getting darker and darker, too. And just as I felt it overhead, I felt the hard rock on my shoe. In one move, I turned around ready to either live or die, scared shitless and about to piss myself. But there was nothing. Nothing but forest and a calm breeze. The dog let out a soft whimper and I backed away, not letting my eyes off the forest while keeping the dog in my field of view. I turned to look at the edge of the mountain, down the direction of the house, and... I saw my mum, who was nervously looking for me with a pair of binoculars. I waved in relief and made my way back down. Visibly shaken, I asked my mum that I needed to talk to my grandma. My mum believed the reason to be that I'd seen a wolf or just some crazy act of nature. I explained everything to my grandma, though, who, oddly, didn't immediately reply with a candid answer. She looked sad as she explained that she didn't have the answer and the person who might have was my great-grandmother who had passed away not too long ago and she had lived up to close to a hundred years. But both our faces fell and she slowly embraced me and I still have questions and I intend to get answers about that forest but my recent talk with my family brought up even more stories. And one that we had all heard was that of the cursed or bloody gold that my grandfather was actually a part of and was murdered for, but that's another story for another time. Needless to say, I still don't have answers just yet, but man, that forest, there's something up there. I'm a 27-year-old female, and at the time this occurred, I was a senior in high school, angsty and steadily into partying. For this story, I'm going to hide her identity, but let's call her Kay. Kay almost cost me my life, and honestly, I never want to see her again. A little backstory on Kay first. She had grown up privileged, given anything she ever wanted, 
Her parents adopted her five cousins and this is when she started to rebel. Her parents, well off, started to pay less attention to her so Kay had all the freedom in the world she wanted. At the time this incident occurred, Kay was 18 and I had just turned 18 as well. We were headed to a kickback at these guys' house. Nothing more than a little bit of weed was expected. Now, I had my share in smoking weed and popping pills here and there. I had just tried ecstasy the summer prior. However, I was planning on staying sober. So she picked me up and we stopped to buy some cigarettes at a gas station. I bought a fountain drink, one with the straw and everything, and this is crucial for later in the story. We arrive at the apartment and everyone is smoking, including Kay, but I declined. She would always say shit about how she never wanted to be high alone, complained about how I never got as high as her, so I obliged and cleared the bong off her hit, not even taking a full hit, mind you. She asked for a drink of my soda and I handed it to her. She had it for a good minute too. I had my head turned talking to someone at the kickback when I looked back at Kay and she was messing with my straw. I didn't think much of it and she handed it back to me and within about 30 minutes or so I started to feel really intensely high to the point that I needed to escape from the group. I go out front to smoke a cigarette only to find that I couldn't even stand up, so I laid on the front porch. And then, all of these dark thoughts flashed through my mind. I felt so sick, like my stomach was being torn open, that I couldn't stand up. I had to crawl to the bushes to throw up, and I thought to myself, all of this off of clearing a bong? So, I laid back on the porch. The apartment was located on a busy street in the city I live in, and I also thought about running into traffic because, honestly, I felt like I was dying. So, I gave myself two options. I could run into the traffic, have a car hit me and end this horrible pain that I was in. Or, I could get some help, maybe flag someone down. And my mind was obviously not in the right state and I knew nobody at the kickback would take me seriously and I knew that something was really wrong. I thought about calling my mum I mean, I must have dialed her number and hung up like five different times. And finally, I called and told her what had happened and that I didn't know why I was so high. Nobody else was feeling the way that I felt and what seemed like an eternity later, Kay came outside looking for me. As I'm puking my guts out into the bushes, she asks me if I want to go to get some food. I asked her if she was serious and she laughed as I puked. What I didn't know was that my mother had called my older brother to pick me up since he lived close to where I was. And he showed up with a machete, ran inside and threatened people because he didn't know who gave me what. It wasn't until I got home that my brother took one look at my eyes and noticed how dilated my pupils were. So they rushed me into the ER after more puking of course. My memory there is a, a bit fuzzy but I just remember asking my sister-in-law if I was going to die and telling her that I was scared. And they ended up sedating me due to the fact that I was yelling and threatening the nurses. Totally out of character for me, mind you. And they did a tox screen, a drug test, and found MDMA, the drug found in ecstasy along with other drugs in my system. I'm assuming that the other drugs were the ones used to make up the ecstasy. Now, this is all frightening and everything. However, what I found out a few days later shocked me to my core. Kay had been to a house party the next night and somebody there had said that she was passing out free ecstasy to four different people. Of those four people, three had grand mal seizures and had to be taken to the ER by ambulance. I'm assuming that whatever ecstasy she used, it was a really bad batch. And remember when she asked to have a drink of my soda? I assume that this is when she dropped the pill inside and it dissolved. She probably crushed it beforehand or something. I have no clue, but at this time in my life, I hadn't done drugs for quite a while. Especially not ecstasy. Kay also went on to tell people that I was the one that slipped her the drug and she had to go to hospital too. She is a pathological liar and has actually had to go to therapy for a long time for mental disorders and stuff. All of this happened because she just wanted me to be high like her. 
It's crazy to think that that night I could have committed suicide because I just wasn't in my right mind. It still affects me to this day and I know it sounds cliche but I have a hard time trusting people with this experience among other things. I also don't like sharing drinks with friends obviously and I get scared when I go out to a bar or a club fearing for the worst. I mean if my own friend has done this to me what's stopping a complete stranger? So I always guard my drink now no matter what. So both my fiancé and I work at Walmart. We live in a smaller town in Colorado and right now there's a stage 2 fire ban due to all the fiery crap going on. Meaning that you can't even smoke a cigarette outside without potentially getting a thousand dollar fine. It's also worth mentioning that because we live in such a small town, the cops and fire department don't have much else to do than patrol parking lots for public cigarette smoking. Anyway... We both smoke cigarettes and both of our cars have different issues right now so we've been sharing one car. We can only smoke in our cars on our brakes for now and since he was working and I wasn't, I visited him on his brakes so that we could spend a few minutes and a cigarette together. I pulled up to the front of the Walmart and thinking that he would only take a minute to get to me, I put my emergency lights on and waited. After a couple of minutes, a car drives past me but slows down and rolls his window down a bit without saying anything. The guy in the car didn't stop, call out or even stare at me for very long before parking but something still creeped me out a little. I called my fiancé and told him to try and hustle a little, mentioning the guy that weirded me out. I understand I had my emergency lights on but... I mean, people do this outside of Walmart for brief amounts of time all day and who conveniently breaks down in front of a Walmart anyway. While still on the phone with my fiancé, whom I can see walking toward my car from the second entrance at this point, I notice the guy get out of his car and walk into the Walmart through my rear view. But instead of continuing in, he cuts immediately toward the side door I was parked by and he comes outside the door and I see him holding what looks like a a baseball bat so I'm freaking out at this point because this guy starts walking toward my car at the same time my fiance is creepy guy gets to the right corner of my hood I'm standing there with what I can now see is a, a two to three foot long sword with a sheath over it looking past my car like he's looking for someone or pretending to look for someone this guy also has a huge assortment of knives that I slid into a belt around his waist. I managed only a few glances at his face without trying to be noticed, but I could definitely tell this guy was on drugs or something. Hard to tell which, but I would guess meth-based, based on his eyes and paranoid actions. My fiancé finally approaches the passenger door when Meth Man turns to him and I'm ready to lay on the horn or something as a distraction, but... Meth Man surprisingly does nothing but spontaneously walk past him and my fiancé safely gets into my car. This guy keeps walking and I pull away and park further into the parking lot and my fiancé and I talk a little bit about how scared we both were, not knowing what the hell this guy was doing. A little more terrifying too, my car had been giving me trouble on the way there and so I test driving it around the lot with my fiancé during his break only proving the problem more urgent. My fiancé was only on a 15 minute break so I had him call our police department and report this, just asking them to come and check it out since he had two hours left and I was tripping out after Meth Man had seen both of our faces. I was one, scared that he might follow my fiancé into Walmart with his sword and try something, or two, follow me home I mean, he saw my car, license plate, and both of us drive around the lot during our test drive. After the cops came and tracked my fiancé down in the aisle he was stocking, they got the description and immediately knew who he was. Turns out, they knew exactly where he lived too, in a trailer park across the street from Walmart, and they'd actually been watching out for him because of previous incidences with a security guard at our store. Apparently, the incident went like this too. The security guard stopped him for some reason and the guy came back a few days later and asked the security guard, what are you still doing in my town? 
to which the security guard replied, What do you mean? I live here. And the guy said to him, Not for long. Like, what the hell? I feel it's also important to mention that we live in a small town a tourist attraction town and the local population is predominantly rich older people because it's a nice retirement place but it's really expensive i mean you see people strapping rifles to their jeeps but not meth heads with swords anyway i guess they found him in the parking lot and warned him that if he was seen around walmart again let alone carrying anything larger than a 10 inch knife he was going to be arrested I haven't seen him since then, and to be honest, I'm glad. The guns are scary, no doubt, but in our town, a lot of people keep them on their waist, so it's not as alarming. However, creepy, drugged-looking man with a two-foot sword in his hand? That's something else. So my partner and I... We decided to spend our 4th of July at this rich people mall in the downtown area of our city. It has actual restaurants in the food court, a great movie theater, and it's easy to get home from there. But when we get there and eat, the place is packed. But by the time that we get to hit the movie, everyone is starting to clear out so they can get to their firework destinations. We watch the movie and maybe five other people are in the theater with us. By the time that we get out and my partner uses the bathroom in the theater, the place is deserted as it's just past 9 o'clock on July 4th. Everyone is out watching fireworks in other words. So we get maybe 10 feet out of the theater and I suddenly have to use the bathroom now too. Except we left the theater so they won't let us back in. Every store is closed early because of the holiday so the place is abandoned and my only option is to use the mall bathroom. Not the worst thing in the world, but it was just inconvenient. The first thing my partner and I notice as we approach the bathroom is a bunch of security guards just running around. Literally running around like they have no idea what to do. Straight up freaking out. I knew that this was a red flag. A huge one in fact, but now I really need to use the bathroom and figure that if it's something incredibly bad, they'll tell us to leave, right? They wouldn't just knowingly let me walk over there and use the bathroom, knowing about danger, right? So, we get closer and we hear banging and screaming coming from one of the bathrooms. But the bathrooms sit next to one another and share a wall, so I have to walk by the security guards and this bathroom to get to my bathroom, which is just the thickness of this wall away. My partner and I figure that it must just be a junkie freaking out in the bathroom and the security guards at a rich mall have never really handled things like this and they don't know what to do. We think this because they see us approach and see me walk past them and say absolutely nothing. And again, I think to myself, if it was serious, they would speak up, right? And so I go into the bathroom and just my luck... Every stall is out of toilet paper, so I have to spend all of this extra time in there checking every stall for toilet paper, walking over to get a hand towel and walking back to the stall and then washing my hands and leaving. By the time I check out, I see all but one security guard literally running away. The guard who stayed has a thousand yard stare and the freak out is still going on in the bathroom. My partner has no idea what's going on, so... We just grabbed an elevator to the main floor and walked outside to call a lift. But we get outside and there are cop cars everywhere. The lights flashing, pulled up in front of the doors. The cops are hopping out and the security guards who ran away are flocking to them. A large and in charge looking female cop looks at one of the security guards as they're walking towards us and says, We got reports of an IED. The security guard replies, yeah, in the upstairs bathroom, and they're freaking out. Then, the door closed behind them, and we couldn't hear anymore. They never stopped being in motion from the time they opened the cop car door to when they went inside, so it was clear that this was really serious. My partner and I looked at each other and just tried to shrug it off. It's probably nothing. 
I mean, it was probably just some drug addict that got their hands on some sparklers or a cherry bomb. We call the lift and a few minutes later they show up. The traffic is a bit heavier at that end. The traffic is a bit heavy at that intersection, so we end up being stuck outside the mall for a minute because we're right at the light. The lift driver asks what all the police presence is about and we're explaining what happened. We see the doors open and the police pushing a guy in a hoodie in front of them who was struggling under the weight of carrying an IED. And let me tell you, this was no cherry bomb. I mean, it was about the size of a tote and held what had to have been between 18 to 24 huge tubes. Fireworks, maybe? It had wires and duct tape and everything looked like it had been connected to either a larger central wire or a giant central fuse. In other words, I think it may have been a bomb. And then the light changed and we just drove away. I have no idea how he got it into that bathroom in the first place. I mean, he could barely carry it. I have no idea if him freaking out was what kept him from setting it off or if he was freaking out because he tried to set it off and it didn't work. I also don't know why they didn't call someone other than the regular police to deal with this, but... My best guess would be that maybe they were all busy, since it's a pyrotechnic based holiday anyway. My partner and I were pretty freaked out to say the least, and the loud bangs that we heard for the next six hours, thanks to our neighbours, didn't help. Well, I have looked around, but nothing about this has shown up in the news or the crime blotters or anything. Which makes me wonder if it got moved to a higher up branch or something, since... It involved explosives in a public place, or if this is so commonplace on July 4th that it just wasn't considered newsworthy. Either way, I don't know what he was doing in that bathroom with all those explosives, but boy, am I glad that it didn't go off while I was taking a dump. Now, the neighbourhood I live in is far from sketchy, and I have to say that the neighbours have been amazing. Well, all except for one dude. This one guy that used to live next door to us was just a complete asshole, and also a convicted sex offender, and his most recent arrest made me think of when we first met. This guy always kept his big dogs barking outside, so my mum went next door to confront him one day. Unlike myself, my mum is pretty aggressive and confrontational, and while I try to avoid conflict as much as possible, she will just go for it. But I'll have you know that I'm extremely protective of my family, and I can sense whether a person is good or bad just by reading their body language. This ability has yet to fail me, so I trust it too. So, when my mum went to confront him about his dogs... He didn't answer the door, but a couple of nights later, I was home alone with my little brother and my mum was at work. The security system we have alerted my phone of a visitor. Because the man I saw in the picture wasn't someone I recognised, I ignored it and nothing happened. The next night, the guy comes round again and this time, my mum answers the door. I sat just outside of view upstairs, listening to the whole conversation from the living room couch. The man was a complete asshole to my mum, saying if she worked very hard or at all, she wouldn't be home to hear the dogs bark and she just needed to get a life and stop being lazy. Now, my mum, I can vouch for her, works really, really hard. She's a single parent to me, a girl with cystic fibrosis, and she's also a real estate agent who managed about 80 houses at that time. And how dare he say that, right? At this point, I got pretty mad and went to the top of the stairs to get a look at this guy, who was calling my anything-but-lazy mother such names. And it was the same fat ass who I saw on the camera the night before. He didn't see me, but he saw my little brother, who had come up from the basement to see what was going on. And the guy's tone changed pretty drastically when he saw my seven-year-old brother. He suddenly became uncomfortably nice. My mum got tired of this guy's painfully creepy sing-song voice and just shut the door in his face and the man finally left. 
About a week goes by and the dogs haven't been hurt at all and the same dude that had called my mum lazy the previous week came by with a plate full of fresh chocolate chip cookies for us and apologised far too many times for what he did. I wasn't home when he brought the cookies over but my mum and little brother said that they tasted good and offered me some but I don't eat food created by strangers, especially creepy strangers that call my mum lazy. I eventually just threw the rest of the cookies away because honestly... I didn't trust this guy one bit. Over the course of about another two months, this guy comes over regularly, inviting us to have barbecues and fires in his backyard fire pit and remains super, super friendly. He lived in a house with a, a bunch of roommates, all of which warned my mum about the man's criminal record and creep factor. I also told my mum to just avoid him and to not let my brother alone outside with him around and to absolutely never go to one of his little barbecues and she listened. But suddenly though, I came home from a weekend with my dad, am home for about a month and the guy was just up and gone. His dogs were never outside and he never came to the door and the roommates were silent about him too. I thought that this was really weird considering his piece of shit car was still parked outside in front of the house too but then i found out why it turns out the guy was living off government handouts for those last few months that he was harassing us and the guy was absolutely a registered sex offender and frequently got duis the fat ass was arrested and charged with yet another dui in a friend's car and when they did so the cops searched his phone I guess they had other reasons to do this, but whatever, and they found lots, and I mean lots, of child porn on it. They also found that shit on his laptop back at his house. The guy was a complete pedo, who seemed to be trying to get close to me, or more realistically, my little brother. Just for reference, he stood about eye level to me, and he was short, fat, neckbeard looking guy who... I could probably take on in a fight since I'm highly trained in martial arts. Taekwondo, Krav Maga, other military style stuff too. And I think he was trying to lure us into things, just thinking about it. When I heard that my suspicions were confirmed, and my mum had another reason to be proud of her guard dog daughter, she brought me to a, a really nice sushi restaurant and I even found a Mountain Dew, my favourite soda. And my mum thinks it's totally nasty though in the fridge next to a crock pot of chicken soup waiting for me. I'm just glad that everything turned out the way that they did and that the dude wasn't given much of a chance to hurt us. Last I heard, he was given a 40 year prison sentence for all the sickening stuff that he was into and for someone as grossly fat and probably sick as he, that's definitely a life sentence. So I used to sit on the computer at my parents' house and chat on AIM with friends. The main landline for the house sat next to me in that room and one night I get a call from a weird number and the voice on the other end asked for me by name. I told him yes, that's me and he proceeded to tell me that he was at a bar in town that I was not from and saw a for a good time call and he just gave it a shot to see what kind of person picked up and I told the guy that I'm 16 and can't even get into bars, nor do I know anyone from that area. He started with, you sound cute, I bet you're a nice girl, huh? He told me that he was 18 and he wasn't even supposed to be there, but he had some friends who covered him. I gave the conversation a chance because I thought one of my friends was messing with me or something and I was hoping to eventually find out who wrote my name on the wall in the bathroom. He asked me questions and I asked him questions and before I knew it, we were talking for hours. He was actually a, a very charming and super interesting guy. I can't remember all that was said because, well, it was about 14 years ago, but I remember telling him that I worked at a movie theater and no, I didn't have a boyfriend and yes, I'd love to meet him sometime. He called me a few times after that night and just chatted with me and the conversation was always flirtatious and even sexual sometimes. Fast forward to a week later and I'm at work when I see a guy pull up in front of the movie theater and come inside. 
He's definitely older than 18 and he looks right at me when he comes through the door. And my blood ran cold and I immediately got this sinking feeling in my stomach that it was the guy that I'd been talking to. I was stuck at the ticket counter and he walks over to me and calls me by my name. All I could say is, hold on a sec, and ran to the other side of the theater where I told a group of co-workers that the guy was here to see me and he was probably a creep. What can I do? He must have overheard because he bolted out the back door and just took off. And for the rest of the day, I felt weird and worried and wasn't sure what to do. I told my mother bits and pieces of what was going on because I knew the situation was sketchy and I didn't help anything. The part that I left out was the fact that I'd been talking to him for a few nights that week and exactly what we were talking about. He calls the house that night and my mother answers the phone and he asks for me and she asks him who is this. He says, none of your business, you just need to let me talk to her. My mum absolutely flips out and says, my daughter is 16 years old, do you know that? I'm her mother and it's absolutely my business, how old are you? And he said, I'm 18 years old and whatever's going on between me and your daughter is between us. She hounds him for another 20 minutes and tells him that she's calling the police. We do some research on his phone number and find out that he's actually 28, married with three kids and had been in the army. We also found several mugshots with arrest from the town that he lived in and my mother but sick of the whole thing and took me down to the police station to file a report. I sit down and tell the police officer that the guy found me at work and he was not who he said he was and that I was scared. The officer asked if I had any contact with him other than the initial phone call and I admitted that I'd been speaking with him for the last few nights and told him where I worked. The officer and my mother both began yelling at me for being so stupid and having poor judgement. The officer said that if anything else happens, to report it, but otherwise, they weren't going to pursue anything. He did call back one more time after that, and I was the one who picked up, and I told him not to call me again, and that the conversation was over. He told me before I hung up, though, that he just wanted to meet a nice girl, but I started all this drama. I still have no idea to this day how he got my name and number, or why he wanted a 16 year old other than the fact that he was a creep bastard preying on young girls but when I saw those mug shots I knew this guy was no good I've had a, a severe case of agoraphobia since I was 6 years old I'm 19 now and female it was 2005 or 6 at the time and I live in a country where there's no psychiatrists for kids. Only regular doctors but they weren't really helpful anyway. Nobody knew what was wrong with me until 2012 when I was finally diagnosed. So me and my parents and the rest of the family were desperate and felt helpless. And then someone my parents knew well informed us to see a hypnotherapist in a few towns away from ours. We went to meet the man, and don't ask me how I managed to keep my panic attacks at bay during the trip, but somehow I did. He was in his late 60s, early 70s, and seemed really nice, and he seemed to understand me too. Didn't think I was a nut job, you know? Anyway, I saw a salvation in him, and kind of looked at him as my, my grandparent, if that makes sense. There were some red flags, of course, but as a six-year-old child, I missed them all totally. My mother was always afraid of him because he insisted on doing the therapy alone with me in another room while she waited. The first few sessions, they were mostly okay, I guess. Not really helpful, but okay. That is, until one day. I asked him, already lying on his couch, if I could go to the toilet, to which... He replied with, do you need to pee or poo? Sure, it was a weird question, but I thought he asked it to know how long I would be in the toilet. But boy, was I wrong. I answered that I needed to pee and he put his fingers on my lady parts. This got me really confused and 
I still, of course, had no idea about any of this type of stuff, but it still felt weird and I didn't understand what was going on. I didn't tell my parents, but I cried a lot and thought that I needed to just suck it up and that I'll no longer be afraid and have panic attacks and such if I just got through with this. But since then, he didn't do it anymore, thank God, and he called my parents on regular basis when he came home, asking them to let me go on vacation with him, which, of course, they politely declined. A few years later, and he's arrested for child pornography, and apparently for sexually abusing a few boys. It all clicked in my head, and I told my parents everything, and we went to the police and gave statements, and that was pretty much it. Apparently, he died in prison of natural causes. Reflecting back on the whole thing, I can definitely see how he was trying to groom me and how I was in very vulnerable positions with him. And I'm pretty certain that if those sessions had kept going, something worse would have happened for sure. This story occurred about 10 years ago when I was around 20 years old. I had been working and still do work at a little Ma and Pa health food store in Virginia for a few months. It's a truly lovely, tight-knit staff with an owner who is basically a mother to me. The other older ladies were my best friends and more aunt-like than anything. Of course, being the youngest lady working here, I got a lot of hours and ended up closing shop many nights. Soon, I was comfortable enough to be closing by myself too. We had a regular customer that had been coming in for quite a few years before I started there. He was a, a local holistic doctor, a brilliant one at that. He was around 40 years of age, divorced and well-to-do. He spent a ton of money at that shop, sometimes taking an entire car full of groceries home in fact. Needless to say, the owner was pleased to have his business. The first time I met him, he said, Well, hello there, I'm Dr. Mayloy, and I don't think we've met. He stuck out his hand and displayed a charming smile, and I'll admit he was quite handsome, very nice and funny too. And my co-worker Pam stood a little to the side, and she sort of gave me a look that said, Hmm, be careful with this one. Sort of a, a sixth sense thing that she has going on. She was, and still is very protective of me, and she said... Oh yeah, this is Diana. She just started here. And he replied, Well, nice to meet you, Diana. I'm sure it's nice to have some young blood around here. That was a bit rude and creepy, I admit. But whatever. He was just trying to be nice, I suppose. Anyway, he took his sweet time and chit-chatted about what he did, how successful he was, and how he will be coming in more often to see my pretty face. He made sure my co-workers didn't hear that part. So, fast forward a few more months and this guy has been coming in almost nightly, specifically when he knew I'd be there alone. Basically, he was right there as I was closing, which would annoy the shit out of me, but I was too nice and knew that we needed the business. And then began the usual inappropriate questions like, how old are you? Where do you live? You must have a boyfriend. You know if you ever need any help with your health or if you need guidance, I can be of service. I also have a home office. I always answered very vaguely and I never told him where I lived. One Thanksgiving, he even asked me if I was a good cook and if I would mind coming over and cooking a turkey for him. And my answer was a definite no. At this point, I informed my boyfriend Jackson, now husband, that this guy is creeping me out. I told him that he would likely be in the store on Friday night and if he could please come in to keep me company while I began to close, that that would be awesome. So, my boyfriend comes in and not a few minutes later, Dr. Mayloy comes in and looks stunned when he sees my boyfriend. I look at boyfriend and nod, and Dr. Mayloy says, Hey buddy, in a condescending tone of course. His whole demeanor has changed and his eyes are dead holes and fixed on me like I had betrayed him or something. My boyfriend is leaning on the counter as Dr. Mayloy is piling stuff on quickly and silently. I should also mention that my boyfriend is a six foot seven, scruffy bearded mountain of a man and he's wearing his cycling clothes. Dr. Mayloy checks out and says, 
see you soon, and ignores my boyfriend and leaves, winking at me. My boyfriend is noticeably pissed, and he watches Dr. Maloy go out to his car. The next day, Dr. Maloy confronts me about my boyfriend. Was that him, your boyfriend? He's a real bro, huh? It was snarky and pompous, and I say, yeah, he's actually really wonderful. Now, Jackson starts staying with me to close whenever he can, and Dr. Maloy starts waiting for me to go on break and follows me, trying to eat with me at the cafe nearby. The ladies are getting really annoyed at this point, and I start hiding. You know, all that type of stuff. Well, I get a pretty bad rib injury on my bike and stay home one day. I lived in a very secluded old apartment, a, a 15 minute walk away that sits above an old art gallery. And that day, my friend Wojtek was visiting from Germany. I was so excited to see my best friend and he brought me food and coffee and we were just chilling inside catching up when there were two knocks at the door and someone asking, is anybody home? And I recognized that voice anyway. What the actual F is this guy doing? I open it and it's Dr. Maloy holding a large suitcase. He said, I heard you were injured and I brought my acupuncture supplies and I'd like to gift you with a session. And he tries to just walk in. My friend is baffled and I say, no thanks. My friend is visiting and he's taking care of me. He looks at my friend and his eyes are filled with rage. He says, I came all the way here for you and this is what I get. Oh, and you have two boyfriends? Disgusting. At this point, my friend steps between us and tells him to leave and shuts the door. Dr. Mayloy bangs on the door cussing and flipping the hell out and eventually he leaves. I told the ladies and my boyfriend too and my boyfriend is enraged and wants to go and kill this guy but... Things calm down for a bit and Dr. Maloy goes away for a minute. But now, his roommate starts scouting me out for him, asking me if I'd like to come over for dinner to their place and have some fun. That Dr. Maloy misses me and, obviously, I'm pissed and tell this guy to piss off. This friend of his just it wasn't right too. Like, pedophile not right. Now, at D-Day... Dr. Maley waits in front of the store as I leave for a break. My boyfriend is on the way to take me out and Dr. Maley stops me and says, I'm taking you. I tell him, no, I'm going to eat with my boyfriend and to just please leave me alone and just stop. And he says, no, I'm taking you to Montana. Get in my car. Leave your boyfriend. I can take care of you for the rest of your life and I need a wife and I know you love me. Don't lie to me. Mind you, he's saying all this through his teeth quietly and angrily, almost with rage. He's holding onto my wrist and trying to drag me away when Pam busts the door open, screaming and pulling his shoulders. Dr. Maloy grabs my hair, basically ripping it out of my head. And then my other hero, Jackson, runs over and tackles this piece of shit and puts him into a headlock. Everyone's yelling and losing it, and I'm silent and in shock. The police are called, and... He's arrested and in cuffs, and the last thing he says is, your ass is mine. Obviously, a restraining order ensues. I didn't press charges, though, because we were about to move anyhow, and I knew I was protected at work. Anyway, years later, I also found some information about him, and apparently, he's older than he led me to believe, too. Which really creeps me out, too, because... And not only did this guy want to take me to wherever the hell he was going to take me, but he was lying to me the entire time. This took place over Christmas break of my sophomore year, so I was 15 and I'm 19 now. I was with my friends John, Mark and Emily and we were hanging out at Mark's house and decided to eat at Crisper's down the street. It was walking distance, but none of us drove yet anyway, and by the time that we made our way back, it was getting pretty dark. His house faces the water, but there's also a street in between it, so there was a boat or dockyard in front of the house. It was a really nice neighborhood, but it wasn't gated or anything, so anyone could roam in and around anywhere just about. 
I remember feeling, though, like we were being watched or something and heard some noises in the bushes, so I mentioned it to Emily and she said that she felt creeped out too. But I forgot about it by the time that we got back and we just got to it. The house was huge and it had three stories and we entered through the garage by using a number code and made the mistake of leaving the garage door open. But the house had an alarm system that would beep twice when you walk through the door, which is important for later. We hung out downstairs in the game room and played with his new puppy for a bit. I remember the puppy wasn't potty trained yet, so she had to stay downstairs in a gated area and we went upstairs to the third floor to watch a movie and not long after, we heard the two beeps of someone opening the door. His family wasn't supposed to be home for another few hours and the pup started going crazy barking and we then heard footsteps. At this point, we were all pretty scared and honestly, the boys weren't any braver than me and Emily. Whoever it was started walking up the second floor and then we heard a man mutter, where are you little bitches? We yelled that we were calling the cops and bolted to a random little room. It was a closet behind the bathroom and we just locked ourselves in there. And honestly, I've never been so scared in my life. I think John was the one who called 911 and I guess the guy got spooked because by the time they got there, he was nowhere to be found. But the door that enters to the house through the garage was left open. I remember going home that night and just bawling. It made me super paranoid about leaving doors unlocked and I have no idea what his intentions were but clearly they weren't good. Also, the pup wasn't harmed, thank god, and the parents thought that we were overreacting when they came home. This was after the police arrived and they didn't take us too seriously so I never really liked them after that but we got home safe and I guess that's all that really matters in the end. In 2010, I gave birth to my middle child. He was born with uh, some serious health issues and ended up being hospitalized for several weeks when he was only a couple of weeks old. But because he was so small, there wasn't a, a whole lot the doctors could do to help improve his condition. Other than IVs and breathing machines and round-the-clock supervision, there wasn't much that they could do. It was such a hard time and my husband and I, we were a wreck. The doctors told us that it was really just a wait and see type of scenario and we should just spend as much time as possible with him and hope for the best. And so that's what we did. My husband was a store manager at a well-known super center at the time and used his vacation time to be at the hospital with us. By the time his vacation ended, our son was still in the hospital, somewhat improving, but it was still really touch and go and my husband felt like he needed to be there with us. And so, he asked for some more time off, and it was granted. He was told to just call and let them know when he could return, and they'd put him back on schedule. As soon as our son was well enough to come home, my husband called his job to let them know that he was able to return to work. Turns out, because of his attendance, they decided to demote him to another position. He'd be making less money, but not a significant amount, and... We could honestly understand where his employer was coming from because they were generous with the time off they allowed him and that our son's health issues weren't really their problem. I mean, he's an employee and he's supposed to be there. Whatever. But we could still survive on his new salary, so it was no big deal. Within two weeks of returning to work, my husband got injured at work though. In order to continue working... His employer said that he had to go to physical therapy before he could return. So, he was out of work again, so soon after returning too. After a few weeks of physical therapy, he was cleared to return to work, but his employer started drastically cutting his hours. And after all the expenses we incurred with our son's health issues and my husband being out of work... Our savings were almost entirely gone and we were not going to be able to keep up with the expenses much longer. At that time, my son had a lot of issues that required me to be able to be home and give him treatment for and I couldn't return to work either so 
my husband started looking for another job with full-time hours so that we could make ends meet. He quickly found a new job, making significantly less money, but still, it was more than what he was making with his current employer's cut hours, so he took it and intended to keep looking for another job as well. We are steadily falling behind on bills and rent and trying to put food on the table for our two children and provide everything a new baby needs, and we realize that we're not going to be able to continue living the way we're living. We explain this to our extremely kind landlord and we're allowed out of our lease. We begin looking for a cheaper place with a, a short lease so that when things pick up, we can move into a better place again. Eventually, we found a place that was incredibly cheap and ended up moving into it. It was in a bad part of town, yeah. A part of Dallas that's well known for being a bad part of town and if you're in Dallas then you probably know exactly where I'm talking about. However, I'm homeschooling my daughter and our son is too small so I'm not worried about them going to school in the area and I figured it's only a few months and when my husband is at work, the kids will stay inside. We were in a desperate situation and I was just trying to be positive and we would make do with what we had until we could do better. But let me just say that this place is a complete shithole. It used to be a house but is now a complex and most of the other houses on our street are abandoned and have been vandalized, including both houses on each side of our home, and the street just looks generally scary. However, our next-door neighbors are extremely kind, and it put me at ease having them next to us, because if anything were to go wrong, they'd be right there. A couple of weeks into being there, I start to relax a little bit. It's a crap area for sure, and not many people live on our street, but the few people that I do meet were really cordial and I didn't get any bad vibes from them at all. Mostly older people and a few families and seemingly no shady characters, much to my surprise. Because of those factors, I begin to feel more comfortable with the area and think maybe I'm just judging it too harshly because of how run down it is and because it's known as a notoriously bad town. So I begin to think that just because it's run down doesn't mean everyone that lives here has bad intentions. So instead of sitting in my backyard to smoke cigarettes, I started sitting on my front porch. And that was a huge mistake. As I'm sitting there smoking my cigarette, people watching, I see a man walk down the street that I've not seen before. Which isn't totally unusual in this type of neighborhood, so I just remain vigilant but also don't think much of it until my dog, which was just a small elderly well-behaved wiener dog started losing her mind when she noticed him. This is not normal behavior for her and I mean she never barked at anyone but when she started barking the guy stops dead in his tracks and stares directly at me and my dog and starts pounding on his chest and throwing his arms in the air like come at me bro. I was freaked out and I was about to turn and go inside with my dog when Something overcame her and she sprinted right off my porch and directly toward the nut job in the street. When he saw that she meant business, he started walking away quickly, but still, my dog kept following him and barking a tiny little ass off, and I was in shock. I didn't know what to do. I mean, I wanted to get my dog, but I didn't want to walk up to this man at all. This whole ordeal went on for several seconds and then the man turned around and started yelling at my dog, threatening her and making stomping motions like he was going to stomp on her head. I was scared and I wanted to protect my dog so I ran out to the street and scooped her up and ran inside. I heard the man yell behind me as I was running in that he was sorry. I went in, locked my doors and tried to calm down and not let my kids see that I was shaken up. A few hours go by and... I just wanted another cigarette, but I didn't want to go back out to the front to smoke, so I was just going to sit on my back porch when I realized that I had forgotten my cigarettes and lighter at the front. I cautiously looked out onto the street from the window to make sure the creep from earlier was good and gone before stepping out, but the porch is large and long, and from the window, you can't really see the bench that sits between my door and my neighbor's door, and when I step out... I'm absolutely stunned to see the man from earlier sitting on my porch on the bench between our doors. I admittedly kind of froze up and before I could say or do anything, 
He said he wanted to apologize for earlier, but he didn't want to scare me by knocking on my door. Okay, yeah, so just give me a heart attack by sitting on my porch and waiting for me to find you sitting there hours later, right? And how did he know that I'd even come back out anyway? He explains that he was just afraid of dogs and he wasn't going to hurt my dog. He was just hoping to scare it off. I'm lost for words and I kind of just nod my head and wait for him to leave. But he doesn't leave. He just sits there staring at me. This continued for a minute before my daughter broke the silence by coming to the door and saying that my pot of water is boiling over. And this is when I really started panicking because now he knows that I have kids and I'm obviously home alone. No car in the driveway. And at this time, my phone was out of service too. It was a hard time and I just couldn't afford my phone bill so... I'm terrified about everything that could happen. The neighbors aren't home and I don't have the car and there's no way of calling anyone and I just felt sick to my stomach. I tell my daughter to go sit down and that I'm coming and I tell the man that I have to go and I book it into the house faster than I've ever moved in my life. I keep looking at the blinds for the man to leave and after about five minutes, he walks away. Ten minutes later, there's a knock at my window. Yes, my window, and I peek out, and it's the man. I reach over to the fireplace and grab my poker, just in case, and I very, very slightly crack the window. He asks me if dinner is done and if he can have some food. I tell him that I don't have enough and I'm sorry, and he goes on to explain that he's homeless and he hasn't eaten in days and he's starving. I know it's really stupid, but I have a soft spot for helping the homeless, and I hate seeing people go hungry, so I told him that if he would go stand across the street at the park while I put a plate of food on the porch for him, that I would give him something to eat and drink, and he agreed, and he stayed across the street while I placed the food on the porch. And after he ate, he left. When my husband got home, he found the used dishes on our porch and I told him what it was about and he scolded me. And rightfully so, I must say. After that, days went by and I didn't see the man again. I just assumed that he was just a passerby, down on his luck and that he was genuinely afraid of tiny dogs, wasn't well socialized and meant no harm really. But boy, was I wrong. Shocking, I know. Eventually, I started seeing him walk down the street again. Occasionally, he'd see me through the window, smile and wave, and that went on without incident for about two weeks, off and on. Then, one day, my dog starts flying off the handle, flipping her shit again, and I assume it's because my neighbor's rather large pit bull had gotten into our side of the backyard. It was not the first time, but the dog was a real sweetheart, so unless my dog is bothered by her, I don't complain about her being and I went to let my neighbor know so he could come and get her. When I stepped out, my neighbor's car is gone, and the man is again sitting on the bench, but doesn't even seem to realize that I'm there. He's just sitting there, slapping himself in the face, drooling and scratching his face and neck. He's rocking back and forth and talking to himself, saying all types of shit that I can't understand and... He doesn't seem to hear my dog barking or notice anything that's going on around him. I'm thoroughly afraid of what I'm seeing and I don't say a word and I just quietly back up and go back inside to figure out how to get this guy off my porch. And then I remembered that he's scared of dogs and maybe if he sees my neighbor's giant pit bull, he'll snap the hell out of whatever trance he's in and move along. My next move is undoubtedly stupid but I'm worried about this man sitting on my porch while my kids are home and my husband and neighbors are gone so I want his ass to go the hell away. So I grab my dog's leash, go to my backyard and put the leash on my neighbor's dog. I tell my daughter to get our dog and go to the back bedroom, lock the door and sit in there and watch TV while her brother is napping and she does. I then gather all my freaking courage and walk this massive pit bull around to my front porch and just stand there waiting for this lunatic to snap out of it and realize that I have a huge dog out here and hope that he's just going to run off. Cookie, 
my neighbor's dog, starts barking upon seeing him. And finally, he slowly looks up and smiles, that absolute creepiest smile that I've ever seen, and says, Hey there, I didn't know you had two dogs. He said this normally in a, a really normal tone, as if he hadn't just been acting like some kind of psycho talking to himself and doing all sorts of other odd shit. So I said, yeah, but she really doesn't like people she doesn't know and sometimes she bites. He got a terrified look on his face and actually jumped over the railing rather than walking past this dog and I. When my husband came home, the creeper was again walking down the street and stopped to talk to my husband this time. I see the interaction in the driveway and I step out to see what's going on and apparently he's asking my husband to bum a cigarette. My husband honestly didn't have any on him and I was out too so we told him that we didn't have any. Also this is the first time my husband had ever seen this man so he had no idea who he was at this time. The man said okay fine can I just have some water giving my husband the same homeless spiel that he'd given me. My husband who also has a lot of compassion for the homeless, gave him a few dollars and told him to go in and fill up a jug of water and give it to him, which I did. He handed him the water and walked to the porch and when he got up to the steps, we hear the man cussing under his breath and talking to himself and turn around to see him pouring at the water we'd just given him, calling us bitches and all sorts of names and we just kind of look at each other like, what the hell is going on? He then calmly turns around and throws the empty jug of water on the ground and then proceeds to pull a full packet of cigarettes out of his pocket and throw it at us. What the hell? I mean, he was just asking for a cigarette and he was mad that we didn't have any. And it turns out that he already had a pack and then he throws them at us. My husband told him to get the hell out of the driveway and to just never come back again and I told my husband that he was the guy that had been coming around and I thought he was on drugs and had some serious mental issues or something. After this, my husband immediately calls to have my phone turned on and starts having his dad stay with the kids and I while he's at work. Once crazy, sees that my father-in-law is there at all times now, we start seeing less of him and actually I only saw him once after this and that was in the back of a police car at a nearby gas station. More on that in a minute. After not seeing him for a while and thinking that he got the hint, we come out one morning to find that there's poopy toilet paper all over our lawn and porch. We immediately know that it was him and we ask all the neighbors if they saw anything and they claim they haven't. So we don't bother calling the police because we know that there's not much that they can really do without proof. I mean, we didn't even know the guy's name. Plus, the cops in this area are known not to be so great anyhow, so it just all felt like a dead end. After the toilet paper incident though, there's two more shit related instances where poo was smeared all over our windshield and then another time on our front door. Along with, you guessed it, toilet paper strewn everywhere. A week or so after the poo incidences, we're pulling up to a gas station and see him in handcuffs on the curb in front of the store. I never found out why, but man, was I so happy to see him being put into a police car. After that, we ended up moving to Austin and getting as far away as we could from that situation. But things are great now and my husband has an amazing job, my children are doing wonderfully and we've never lived anywhere like that again. I don't know whatever became of him, but I pray that he got the help that he needed. Because when he was sitting on my porch that day and just acting all crazy like he did, I knew then that he could hurt someone. Possibly even children. Probably around two years ago, I had gotten a, a job at a certain Australian rip-off steakhouse in my hometown. I was really excited to start this job because it had been the first time I'd had a job while in school that year due to how busy I was. It was a, a nice healthy distraction from constant schoolwork and extracurriculars. And plus, I was getting paid. And 
Being able to afford food was a fun thought. In fact, I don't think I'd ever been so excited to buy hamburger meat. Anyway, my days there were a lot of fun, but we had this one horrible mean manager named Steven that would get super upset and angry at other employees, but he would never get upset at me. Stephen was probably in his mid-60s and he was the kind of guy who you could just tell hadn't been happy with how his life had turned out. Now, I was a super hard worker and liked my job, but there was definitely some times that I deserved to get yelled at. But he never would. Like, never raised his voice at me. In fact, it got so bad that all of my co-workers started making jokes that I was Stephen's favourite. It got to the point where I'd be on shifts with some other girls and he would rip into them for stuff that was definitely wrong on both of our parts, but would never get angry at me. Eventually, I wasn't capable of putting up with the poor treatment of my co-workers anymore and pulled another manager, Elliot, aside to see how I could file a complaint and get justice for my fellow servers. Elliot and I became super close since I started working there and when he sat down with me, he held me as I cried over my uncertainty. This job meant the world to me and honestly, I didn't want to lose it. He reassured me though that it was alright and that he would handle it. Over the next few weeks, he would make me feel better whenever something happened and he constantly reassured me that action from corporate was coming. About two months after the original complaint, I had decided on taking a vacation to Texas to visit my mother. I said bye to everyone at work for a whole two weeks and had so much fun hanging out with my mum that I forgot about work. It was easily the break that I definitely needed from the work environment. Not too long after I get back from my vacation, I come back to work and just after a few shifts, I realise that Elliot isn't there anymore. I figured that Stephen had fired him for standing up and I was livid. In my anger... I started talking to my co-workers about the bullshit and they all looked confused and baffled by what I was saying. After stopping mid-sentence and asking them why they were looking at me like that, a co-worker corrected me and told me that that's not why he got fired at all. Apparently, Elliot had been caught keeping two eight-year-old boys in his basement. Elliot was arrested and that's why he was fired. Apparently, he had also been caught in the past for publicly urinating on a seven-year-old and beating his own children who got taken away from him permanently when he went to prison for the first time. Both boys were safely returned to their parents, but they'd been there for at least two months from what I was told. And needless to say, I was done with that restaurant at that point and I just quit on the spot. But when I think back on just how much I trusted Elliot, how he lured me in with his niceness and politeness, it gives me chills. I served in the Marines from age 18 to 28 when I was honorably discharged due to a pinched nerve in my back which led to surgery. Thankfully, surgery worked for me and while I recuperated, I took a job as a driver for an assisted living facility. Technically, I worked for two sister companies which were a 35 to 45 minute drive from one another and I would drive meds, patients, etc. between the two facilities. Usually, I worked the day shift. However, the night shift driver suddenly quit without warning and I was asked why they found someone to cover his shift. One night, I was asked to drive some meds between Site A and Site B. It was no biggie. I happily hopped into the van and headed to Site B. In order to get to Site B, I had to drive through a heavily forested area and it was spooky, but as a former Marine and someone who grew up in the boondocks, I don't scare very easily. Or so I thought. So, I'm listening to a book on tape as it was an older van with just a CD player. And the radio, it didn't work very well and this was before XM became the new thing. I hear some rustling in the back of the van though. Now, a month prior, a squirrel had somehow made its way inside the van and I thought that maybe it was another one and the sound stopped as I just shrugged it off. I'm driving through the forest, lost in thought when something 
bites me hard on the back of my neck. I swerve the car almost smashing into another car, and my heart's beating a million miles a minute, and I immediately pull over. I run out of the car and open the back, and I'm expecting some sort of rabid squirrel, but sitting there, with a blank expression on her face, is Agnes, a woman who had severe mental issues and was a resident there. She was muttering that I'm not supposed to be here. She had bit my neck, and what was more disturbing was that she had a knitting needle in her hand and she must have taken it from another resident. I ended up calling two of the staff who worked at the ward she lived in and they ended up coming to get her and they talked her down into giving them the needle and managed to get her back to the facility without harm. I had to go and get my bite looked at and I ended up quitting a few months later after another crazy incident. I stayed away from Agnes the rest of my time there and man... Am I glad that she used her teeth and not that needle? A few months ago, a friend of mine introduced me to someone that he knew. We'll call him AJ. AJ is gay and his big claim to fame is that he slept with a well-known UK athlete who is still in the closet. We had a drink and he talked about that and we really bonded and he seemed like a really cool dude. He also lived near the city of Manchester, so I mostly spoke to him online. He would call me a lot, and we eventually arranged a night out in Manchester's famous gay village. For those of you who don't know, the gay village is on Canal Street in Manchester. And yes, on the street sign, someone crossed out the sea in Canal. It's literally a row of clubs and pubs on one side, and on the other is a canal. If I'm being honest, I hate nights out, and I really hate gay clubs. I'm just not the kind of guy who wears his sexuality on his sleeve, and to be honest, I've already said the word gay more times than I'm comfortable with so far. But we went ahead anyway, and the first part of the night was all right. AJ took me to all the clubs, and they were nice enough, and there were decent people just dancing and stuff, even if they did look at you like you were new fresh meat. There were a few clubs with things going on inside that kind of scared me for entirely different reasons and at one point I was hit on by a guy in his 70s who gave me his business card which was pretty funny I suppose. I used to have really bad anxiety and although I've learned to cope with it and move forward in my life I still battle it when dealing with new situations. My anxiety is inward focused Meaning that if my heart beats too fast, a, a panicked voice will tell me that it means my heart is about to stop. If my stomach rumbles, it'll tell me that I've got a stomach flu. And for this reason, I was attempting fate and I was being super responsible drinking. I had about three pints of beer and I lost count of how many AJ had. Around midnight, we all walk out of one club. AJ is steaming drunk, uh, stumbling around when a security guard from another club says to him, you're not coming in here. AJ says nothing and then aggressively shoves the guy to one side and storms into the club. And AJ got himself arrested. Great. I'm in a city that I don't know very well. My guide is pissed drunk and arrested and there's no trains home for six hours. Although it's summer, there's a chill in the air too, so I decided I'm going to go into one of the quieter clubs. The quieter is a, a relative term here, that's for sure. And it was still loud as shit. So I go in and I order a beer and I sit at a table which was towards the back and in the dark. I sit alone and just rest there for a while. And then he shows up. A man sits at my table and... He looks to be in his late 20s, early 30s. He's got a nice smile and white teeth, short brown hair and clearly well kept. The guy had style and he engages me in conversation. Just about why a guy like me is alone here and all that corny, I want to get in bed with you subtext. I viewed it as a game and every statement that he made I would try and come up with them an answer that pushed him away without being rude. So when he said, you got anywhere to be tonight... I replied with, not yet, but I'm waiting for the next train home. And when he said, are you on your own? I replied with, I wasn't, but I am now. He kept buying me drinks, which I just hid under the table when he wasn't looking. And after a while, he seemed to stop coming on to me and instead just wanted to talk. But we found it hard to talk to each other in this place with all the loud music. So we went outside, 
sneaking our drinks in our pockets. We walked slowly along the canal for about an hour just talking about stuff. I was pretending to be a bit more drunk than I was because I wanted him to think that he hadn't wasted his money buying me drinks. He seemed genuinely interested in my life and my stresses at the time too, so I just wanted to be nice. I had been through a messy breakup and after a while, I was just venting to the guy and he smiled and listened to everything I had to say. After a while, he sat on the wall with his feet dangling over the canal and I sat next to him. The sky had started to glow dark blue, meaning that it would soon be light and I was starting to think about getting a move onto the train station when I noticed that he was looking at me. I looked back and he said my name and said, this is really important. He seemed like he was trying to find the right way to phrase something and then he said, have you ever thought about ending your life? You don't have to tell me because I know it's personal. I replied honestly and said, no, things would have to get really bad in my life before I would want to end it like that. He grimaced at me and looked back at his feet. I looked back at the sky and I was just about to say something when something pushed my back and I fell from the wall right into the canal. I think my brain did a hard reset because when I went into the water, everything just went out of my mind. It was ice cold. I remember my mind just switching back on and I tried to take a breath but I was underwater. I freaked out and flailed my arms and legs and it took a lot of effort to move them because all my limbs felt like they were made of stone. I surfaced and the guy was stood on the fence and he leaned down and lent out his hand to me and I swam towards him and took it, struggling to breathe. I grabbed his hand and he lifted me about halfway back up before he pushed me back in, even further this time. At this point, my mind clicked that it was him who pushed me in the first time, so I swam instead to the other side of the canal, grabbed the wall which was too steep for me to climb out, and I shouted for help as loud as I could. I saw him look at me and then just take off running away. I heard voices nearby and someone screamed seeing me in the canal. I was shaking and feeling faint and I don't remember a lot about what happened next, but I remember grabbing a rope and putting in a lot of energy to climb up. I remember someone in an apron wrapping me in a blanket and I remember the ambulance people talking to me and asking me in the most patronizing way how much of you had to drink. I woke up in a hospital bed feeling terrified. I mean, that guy had tried to kill me. The look in his eyes when he reached out his hand to me, he wasn't smiling or showing any emotion. His face was blank as he pushed me back into the water. I told the doctors that I wanted to talk to the police and I gave a full statement to the officers and they took my details and said that they would check the CCTV. I felt like the stupidest idiot ever when they asked me for his name and I realized that he'd never given me one. It made me realize that the whole night he barely said a word about himself in fact. He just asked questions and commented on things about my life. About mid-morning, AJ, freshly bailed, came and picked me up from the hospital and took me back to his, and I told him everything, and he said, I think you've had a really lucky escape. The reason why is because this guy that I met apparently matched the profile of a potential serial killer dubbed The Pusher. Since 2008, there have been 80 bodies found floating in the canals in Manchester, most of whom are found near the gay village and most of whom are young males like me. The police kept releasing statements saying that there's no evidence that it's a serial killer, but how much evidence is there going to be when the guy just walks up and fucking pushes you into a canal? I mean, the water is so cold that most people just go into shock and die, especially if they're drunk. This has to be the same guy who pushed me in and it really terrifies me. I'm... Honestly so scared to think that I'm a serial killer's one guy that got away. I don't even live near Manchester and I'm totally scared about this. I keep thinking that I can feel someone's hand on my back when I'm sleeping. I don't know who he is or why he did this or anything. And so, back to my warning. I know that the gay culture has a, a tendency towards silence and... It's getting better these days, but a few of my friends have been sexually assaulted and they don't go to the police because they think that the gay factor will somehow count against them. But I'm asking you all, 
anyone who visits Canal Street in Manchester, please have a good time, but do not take drinks from strangers. Do not go for walks with strangers and make sure to stay the hell away from that canal. If you see anything or know anything, please contact the police too. The more information and pressure that they have on them, the more likely they are to put people on the street to actually look for this freak. And please, be safe out there. There's monsters on the street. The year was 1983 and I was four years old, very happy and very trusting, until the fateful day that I was made aware of this strange man. It was Thanksgiving and we made the trip to visit my mother's side of the family. We were at a grandparent's house. At the time, I was an only child and as a matter of fact, the only child there. I remember being bored after everyone had eaten and asked my dad to take me to a large well-known park in the area. It stood out due to the fact that it had giant animals that were part of the park. A penguin with a slide in its stomach, an elephant that you could climb with help of a ladder, a kangaroo that you could somehow bounce in, and anyways, you get the point. My dad jumped at the chance to get out of the house and away from everyone. He was a stranger here, and these were in-laws that he never really knew. Cousins, aunts and uncles, great-grandparents, not to mention the friends of these people, and all really tight-knit and knowing each other for years. So... We arrived at the park and my first impression when pulling up was the number of kids running around. I noticed the occasional parents as well, keeping a watchful eye on their children. My dad told me that he would watch me from the car and to have fun with the other kids. I jumped out of the back seat and scrambled to the penguin first. I remember bonding with the other kids and I had of course never met any of them before, but kids seemed to have a, a natural tendency to just flock together, trust one another and simply play. I was running around like most of the other children, going from slides to the swings and eventually grew tired and just sat on a bench. It had only been about 15 minutes since I had arrived and was planning on being there for several more hours and then I noticed him, a man that stood out. I could tell, even as a four-year-old, that he didn't belong here. He was dressed in a trench coat, a hat that matched and kept looking around staring at different kids. In my childlike mind, he actually resembled Inspector Gadget, and I knew immediately what he was up to. He was looking for an unattended child, and then he eyed me, my dad being in the car several hundred yards away, and he made the mistaken assumption that I had somehow, as a four-year-old, made it to the park alone. I was then on high alert, and I tried to start playing, but all the joy of the day had been sucked out by this creep. I went down a slide, only to see that he skulked over to me like a wraith, watching and waiting. I couldn't bear the tension or the fear anymore, so I ran as fast as possible back to the safety of my father in the car, and I jumped into the back seat, head down as to keep me hidden from his view. I told my dad that I was ready to go back to my grandmother's house and was relieved as we started pulling away. My curiosity, though, took over and I peeked my head above the back seat of the car and looked out the back window. And he was there, looking directly at me and making a come here motion with his finger, all the while smiling. I ducked even lower and remained that way until we arrived back at my grandparents' home. I have no reason why I failed to tell anyone what happened. Maybe fear that it would somehow bring me closer to him or that I wouldn't be believed. But I didn't tell anyone. I then forgot about this strange man or at least didn't think that I would ever see him again. Flash forward to 1986 and my parents and I move into a low rent apartment. I'm fine at first and everything's normal and I then noticed one day that our neighbours had moved out and that a new neighbour had moved in and one guess as to who it might be. Everything came back to me in a flash. I freaked out, but for some reason, just kept it all in, not saying a word to anyone. I tried to avoid him and hoped that he wouldn't remember me from the brief moments a few years before, but I was sadly mistaken. 
As soon as he saw me, I saw a look of recognition on his narrow face. I didn't play alone after that, and as a matter of fact, I didn't go outside really unless my parents were with me. Several months had passed, and of course, I was still on the defense, just waiting for the worst to happen. One day, though, I noticed something odd. He actually had a boy with him, roughly my age and clearly scared. The child was rarely ever seen, but when seen, the man had a firm grip on him at all times. My mother, not apparently picking up on the fact that this man was a sick freak, in my mind, the boogeyman, told me that I should go next door to his apartment and ask to play with what she thought was his son. No way! Never in a million years did I ever think of doing such an absurd thing and refused without telling her why. I remember seeing the boy a few more times over the course of what had to be weeks and I just always remembered the, the look on his face. The fact that he wanted to tell me something but he was too afraid. It still really haunts me to this day and even though I was just a child, I'm still filled with guilt for not saying anything. But it was because I was afraid. Afraid for my life, in fact. Afraid of whatever the hell this strange monster of a man wanted to do with me and the boys like me. The last time I saw the boy was in the man's car and it was an old cream-colored 60s model and the boy was crying and looked pretty much out of his mind. I stored this memory away and hid it. The darkness of the moment too big for my childlike mind to understand. Eventually... The beast moved away and soon after, we did as well. I was growing up and years had passed and I was a big boy, or so I thought, in the third grade maybe and my parents had just taken pictures of me playing, being a kid, just regular family stuff. The man was lost in my memories and fading slowly but of course never really forgotten. The photos were developed by a local grocer and they were picked up and looked over and left on the dash of my parents' car. We then went to the park in my city. It was summer and my parents and I got out of the car and did our tour of the park. The car windows were left down because there was no reason to suspect anything foul happening. I remember that we were at the top of the park and on a large rocky hill and looking down, wouldn't you know who was there? That same man, dressed in a, a long coat again but much shabbier, trash eating, looking quite disheveled and dirty. I remember being afraid, but happy in a strange way, at seeing him so down and out, homeless and hungry. The guy then saunters over to my parents' car and looks in, reaches for something and just makes off. It was the photos of me. My parents yelled and were upset, but as mentioned earlier, we were way above him. The hill we were on turned into a sheer cliff, in fact. The drop was at least 30 feet. You would have to walk completely back around to catch him and my father tried but by the time that he got to the car, the guy was just gone. My dad came back to us and we drove home and my parents chalked it up to just random chance. They had no memory of this man and they only saw a mental case, homeless and lost. I processed the whole thing and freaked knowing that he was still so close even though years had gone by and of course this naturally made me think that he was long gone or dead or at least not able to magically appear where I was and steal my photos. It's now 1989 and we live in a different house, same city. I'm much bigger and of course more aware of the world, the positive changes and the negatives. It was summer again and my parents had spent a late night with their longtime friends. It was about one in the morning before we began making our way back home and I was wide awake just staring at the window, eating up the world's visuals with my eyes and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there, there was the stranger again, once again dressed in the same getup as before. I almost shrieked in the back seat but instead remained quiet and hid, praying that he didn't see me. I did notice though that he was walking rather quickly as if he was on a mission to bring fear into the hearts of children everywhere or something. And my parents, they take notice of him and comment on how odd it was that he was dressed in a winter coat and hat in the summertime. But 
They don't seem to realize that this is the same man that we'd seen seemingly out of nowhere before, countless times. I believe that he didn't see me and I sat up again as we made our way up the street. And then we saw her, a 13 or 14 year old girl crying and running like her life depended on it. She kept looking back, looking for someone or something. I knew what she was looking for and honestly, I was afraid for her. I remember my parents asking her if she needed help or a ride or something but she just flatly refused any help and just kept running. I don't know what she thought that we were up to, but I'm guessing whatever the man had said to her put fear into her heart and she wasn't going to trust anyone or anything at that moment. I never had another incident with this dark version of Inspector Gadget after this and at times wondered what became of him. I sometimes feel the need to research the newspapers, internet and old phone books, anything to discover who he was and what he may have done to the boy I saw and maybe others. I usually begin looking but I never find anything substantial. Anyway, it still kind of freaks me out to think that there's some weird ass guy out there who stalked me for years with my childhood photo. So last week, I told a story about a woman named Agnes who was in the back of a van and who bit me. I hope you guys remember because some of you guys asked if I'd recount the story that led me to finally quit my driving job. So, a few weeks after the Agnes situation, we got a new director and a new charge nurse. Now, if you're thinking, well, maybe things got better and patients stinking off in the vans would be the things of the past, you'd be wrong. Neither gave a shit about the patients under their care. In fact, both were carrying on an affair with each other which led them to be let go from their previous employer. They liked to stay holed up in the director's office just pretending to work, if you catch my drift. Anyway, on to the story. I pull up Saturday morning to utter chaos. It turns out that a patient got out of his room and not just any patient though. A patient for the past two weeks who hadn't been receiving his meds for his paranoid schizophrenia because head nurse didn't believe he suffered from it and was being over-medicated. Not to mention that the patient had on his chart that he was extremely combative and needs medication, and Nurse Ratchet decided that he didn't because we needed to cut costs. I mean, this guy had caught an unaware janitor and beat him pretty good with a mop bucket, and he's loose now. Obviously, the police were called, right? Nope. The board of directors told staff that no one was to call the police except him and that that was the last resort. The poor janitor who is bloody and battered is taken to the medical bay so Nurse Ratchet can fix him up. Meanwhile, I'm asked to join the search for the patient, so myself and two orderlies and our security guard who was pushing 70 started looking. We, against my better judgement, break off into groups of two, opening doors and calling the patient's name. We go into the first cafeteria in the dementia ward, the ward that housed the residents with memory loss, more severe physical issues, anyone like Agnes who tended to wander off basically. Except the design was flawed as hell. Residents still got in and out, but in the cafeteria or the big rec rooms, the door was behind you, so someone would have to come and let you out if you got locked out. So, we're in the cafeteria looking around, and I hear a huge bang from the kitchen, like someone pushing over something heavy. Myself and the orderly that was with me go running, and there, trying to rip the bars off the window and escape, is the patient. The orderly, like an idiot, presses his radio. And the second the patient heard that sound, he's moving towards us with a huge metal soup ladle and a Phillips screwdriver in his hand. Thank God that they keep the knives locked up, but still. I'm a big guy, but this patient was easily 6 foot 5 and 300 plus pounds. The orderly is radioing for help and I'm throwing things at this guy who's got murder in his eyes. No lie, I've seen some pretty messed up shit in the Marines, but... That this guy's dead eyes will still haunt me forever. And then he's on me and I'm doing my best to keep him from gutting me with a screwdriver when he just starts choking me with his bare hands and I'm getting some good punches in but he's like feeling no pain. 
The orderly realizes, oh shit, I'm being choked to death, and he jumps on his back and starts wailing on this guy. I blacked out, and when I woke up, I was being put on a stretcher. My trachea was so bruised that I couldn't talk past a whisper for weeks. I came very close to actually dying, but thankfully, the orderly got a hold of a cast iron pan and whacked the patient unconscious. As you can imagine, both the director and the charge nurse, they were let go pretty quickly, and included in a lawsuit brought against them by the board of directors of long-term care and by myself, the janitor and the orderly and the family of the patient too. It also caused a huge shake-up in the facility, and I've heard since then that things have run a whole lot better. As for me, I quit, even though I was offered a raise. Last I heard, the patient got back onto his meds and was eventually released into the care of his family. Growing up as a child, I lived on a street full of young, excitable, and rowdy kids. We would all play out until the early evening during the summer holidays, and all of our parents knew each other and got along. I remember one day at school that two new boys, twins actually, started and were introduced as living nearby, actually on my street, and we were all encouraged to make them feel welcome, etc. I distinctly remember being terrified of them immediately. They looked incredibly gaunt with tired, sunken eyes, cold, dull-looking skin, and neither could be told from the other. Throughout school, both boys were glued to each other and refrained from any interaction with other kids, despite some of our best efforts even. They would just stare at the floor and avoid all human interaction, and eventually me and the rest of the gang just forgot they existed. That was until one summer evening whilst playing out. They appeared in the street and stood in the middle of the road just staring at the floor. Out of nowhere, one of them launched a rock at one of the gang and it hit him on the back, leaving a huge bruise. One of the more confident boys approached them and asked what the deal was. And they both looked up at the same time and said something to him and just walked away. During this, I remember looking in the direction of the house and seeing a, a male figure leering out the window. Upon seeing me looking, he swiftly drew the curtains closed and it was still broad daylight. Here, I started to recognize that this family was weird as hell. The boy from our gang never told us what the twins said and just asked us to quit asking. But they never played, they just lingered in the street watching all of us. They would just glare and never interact. I remember seeing one of them actually kick a live cat across the street while the other chased it away when it finally landed. This went on for some years and eventually some kids moved away just leaving me and one other boy from the original gang. We were about 13 or 14 now and would venture further than our street to play out. One night, me and the other boy were playing football when the twins approached us and kicked the ball so hard that it flew miles into the woods that we were near. The boy I was with began to complain, but before he could finish, one twin launched an uppercut to his face, lifting him off his feet and rendering him unconscious. I remember that I froze and shortly after began to scream and the twins just walked slowly past me and one pushed me hard to the floor. The other made a kicking motion towards my head to which I ducked and they walked off, in sync of course. I rang for an ambulance and after being checked by paramedics, we were returned home to our aggravated and concerned parents. Later that evening, the twins' father appeared on our doorstep, hysterically accusing me and my friend of bullying and provoking the twins into the assault, threatening my parents that we would regret provoking them. After this, we both just stopped playing out there because we were terrified of the twins. They were constantly in fights in school, but not scuffles. Actual violent assaults causing many victims to need to go to hospital for treatment. Until eventually, they were just suspended for good. They moved from our street and I didn't hear of them for years. Fast forward about 10 years though and an old school friend and I are catching up and they tell me how they found out that the twins were beaten and neglected by their father growing up, were forced to train in jujitsu almost every day and lived like a, a very regimented life. 
There were also claims of sexual abuse, but I'm not too certain how much weight all that holds. Part of me feels sorry for them, but the other part wonders what horrific crimes they'll go on to commit in adult life. And another part of me wonders if they would ever try to target me and the gang and come back for us in adult life, even though we did nothing wrong. I have no other information about them currently, but yeah, deranged twins, I hope we never meet again. This happened about four years ago when I was 15. At the time, I would usually go to the school pool for a swim, which would take place after school at about 5 or 6 p.m. There weren't many people in the pool then, so it was perfect for me because I don't like to spend my free time in crowded places, and also, I get to swim freely. You guys may be familiar with the bathroom stall in a high school, each stall has a door, but below the door there is a space large enough for you to see other people's feet. And, yeah, this is what happened. After my swim, I got out of the pool and went straight to the bathroom stall to take a shower. Before that, I noticed that there were only me and one other person in the pool center. I didn't think much about it, but while I was showering, I had these kind of strange feelings, so I turned around. Remember the space between the door and the ground that I talked about before? Well, that person was lying on his back and watching me shower. I was terrified and then he asked me if he could suck my dick. I don't remember exactly how I reacted, but I'm pretty sure that I yelled, get the hell out, and tried to kick his face and missed. And quickly, I changed my clothes and got out of the pool. When I rode my bicycle home, I heard his whistles from behind me and they were wolf whistles, like the ones in the movies where the hot lady gets after walking past several men and all that. To this day, I don't go to the pool for a swim anymore because of what happened. And thinking back, it was not only creepy, but also really gross. I mean, to lie down in the bathroom where people walk on and piss on, I don't get why he had the nerve to do that. After the incident too, I read somewhere that the pool had a bad reputation because of these creepers. In fact, one victim was sexually assaulted in one of the stalls and contracted AIDS. It's really chilling when I think about what could have happened to me that day. This story is so weird that I almost pushed it out of my mind, but... My friend reminded me of it last night, and now I'm creeped out all over again. So, I was around 15 or 16, and I was on vacation at Walt Disney World sometime during the summer. My family has the vacation club membership thing, and so we go a few times a year and live pretty closely anyway. We were staying in the vacation club villas, which is a separate building from the main hotel. I brought two of my friends, Savannah and Victoria, and we got bored around 2am, so we went down to the gym. It's open 24 hours. We weren't going to work out or anything, just take mirror selfies and mess around with the exercise balls and stuff. There's a desk for the, the spa portion of the gym, I think. Well, maybe it's a sauna. I don't really remember, but since it was so late and there were no employees, and we were messing around behind the desk, and... We found a notebook, and I'm not sure why, but I was super annoying at the time, and I decided to write my Twitter and Instagram handles, and so did Savannah. Well, looking back, I'm pretty sure that we could have gotten in trouble for this, since guests aren't supposed to screw around with the desk and all. I didn't think much of it, though, and we left the gym, and the next morning, we checked out of the hotel. Well, on the drive back home, I get a, a Twitter notification, and it's from a a diaper fetish account. The creepy thing is that this account was active for a while and had a disgusting pictures of grown men in diapers and other disturbing pictures of children. And so does Savannah too and we're both just sitting there looking at each other like, what the hell? The account tweeted at us saying something like, I know who you are and what you've done and your vacation will end abruptly. They tweeted some more creepy stuff, like telling us to watch our backs, but 
I knew it was clearly because we left our names on the notepad. I didn't reply back and then I noticed a new follower and it was my name. But the username was similar to the diaper account. But then the account started tweeting my address, my phone number and random pictures of me from deep in my social media. They do the same thing with Savannah's name and at this point we're both shitting bricks. I get a text from a random number and I'm assuming that they used a texting app saying that they were watching us and knew more than we thought. They even started texting about my boyfriend at the time and asked some really messed up questions about him. I told them to piss off and then I just blocked it and I didn't get any more texts after this but the Twitter account continued to tweet about me and random details that I knew that they had to dig to find. I blocked them on that too and put all my accounts on private and I never got any more messages but the Twitter accounts, they're still up to this day. Honestly, I don't know how they got my address and my phone number or all my information about me but it creeps me out to think that there's some random fetish account out there, obviously started by a weirdo that has all this information about me. This happened late last summer. I'm 28, female, and I live in a house with my husband. We live in a really large city on a street with row homes, and my house is on the end of the block. It's very common for us to have door-to-door -door solicitors where I live, and my husband recently got a new job, and as a part of his training, he needed to fly to Texas and stay for two weeks at the company corporate training center. I wasn't thrilled with the idea of being home alone for two weeks, of course, but... I decided that it was time to put on my big girl panties and get over it. I mean, how bad could it be, right? I mean, I can watch all the shows that my husband hates watching, cook the food he doesn't like to eat. It'd be fine. So, he leaves for his work trip and I continue on with my regular routine. I work part-time, about 20 hours a week, so I spend a lot of time at home binge-watching TV and cleaning the house. One day, I'm sitting on the couch and I hear a knock at my door and assume it's the delivery person leaving a package. I wait to hear the glass storm door close, indicating the delivery driver has left and I hear nothing. And then, another knock. I am kind of uh, a bit antisocial, so I didn't feel like dealing with any solicitors or anything and I ignore the person and just keep watching TV. I hear another knock and I pause the show and get up to peek out the front window. And there's a man at the front door that I don't recognize. So I don't open the door for him and I see him kind of throw up in his hands in frustration and then just leave. I'm creeped out by it but I don't think of it again for a few more days. I come home from work a few days later and I start getting to work cooking something for dinner. I'm in the middle of washing some dishes when I hear a knock at the door again. I go to peek out the blinds and see the man from a few days before with another guy this time. Just to paint a picture for you, the first man, the one who's been there twice, is a huge guy. Honestly, he looks almost like Dwayne Johnson, The Rock. I mean, he's huge, muscular and tall and he's holding a clipboard. The guy with him is a skinnier black guy, not very tall, but taller than I am. I'm 5'6". The guy holding the clipboard knocks again and I open the main door to the house. The glass door is still locked and I just look at them. I say to them, can I help you? And they say, yeah, we're here to set up our security system. We're from the large national security company. Now, I own my own house and I bought it before my husband and I even met and... We didn't have a security system installed and I hadn't set up an appointment with anyone either. I said to them, I'm pretty sure that you have the wrong house and I haven't set up an appointment with anyone. They say that your husband probably made the appointment and just forgot to tell you. My husband and I, we never make any major decisions about stuff like this without talking to each other first. So I say to him, I don't think so and... He holds his clipboard out to show me that he has my address filled onto his form and he says that I can check it out. 
For some reason, I unlocked the glass door to take a look at it. Maybe my husband really did forget to tell me that they were coming. I mean, he is away for two weeks. Maybe he wanted to try and make me feel safer by getting an alarm installed. The form looks pretty generic and it doesn't have either of our names on it. He then say to me that we just have to come inside and check for weak points so we can find out where to install the sensor. It won't take long. The guy's partner, who hasn't spoken yet, nods in agreement. I tell them, well, I'm home by myself right now because my husband is at work, so I don't really feel comfortable having you inside. They say, we're really from a large national security company, and the skinny guy holds out his name badge. I reply with, I could print out a name badge that says I'm the Pope, but that doesn't mean anything, sarcastically too. They look annoyed now, and the rock starts motioning like he's going to try and come in the door, so I tell them I'm sorry, but I'm cancelling their services and to leave. The rock seems mad at this point, and starts pushing against the door that I have halfway open, and is looking down at me like he's going to stomp on me. He says to me, we really need to come inside and take care of this now, looking past me into my living room. By now, I'm really mad that they're being so persistent about getting in when I've already told them no. So, I tell them to leave and I'll reschedule my appointment for a different day. I shut the door in their faces and lock it, waiting for them to leave. But they stand there for a few minutes before walking away and I wanted to see what car they got in, but they left on foot and started walking down the block. Once I was sure that they had gone, I texted my husband and he said that he had no idea who they were. I immediately googled the phone number for large national security company and explained to the woman on the line what happened. She tells me that the men, they weren't from her company and she had no record on file that I'd ever made any appointments with them. And now I'm really creeped out and she suggests that I go make a police statement. I went to talk to the police and they said that they don't know what they can really do since I don't have any information about the men. I tell them though that I'm going to be home alone for at least another week and it would make me feel better if they could drive around my neighborhood a few times a day just to keep an eye out for them if they could. They agree to do so and I just go home. After this incident, I made sure I had every window and door locked and tried to forget about it. The following week, I go out to lunch with my mum somewhere in the city and we come back to my house to hang out for a bit and my next door neighbour is outside. My mum hasn't met her yet so I introduce them and we're standing outside of my house chatting when my car pulls up. It's a plain, non-marked regular old car and a woman walks up the steps and asks, which one of you lives at 123 Any Street? And I tell her that I do. She says, hi, I'm from Large National Security Company and my partner was here a few days ago to do an installation but you wouldn't let him in. At this point, I looked embarrassed and just started laughing. I said that I felt like such an idiot and that I actually filed a report with the police about them because I was really nervous. And I'm sure you understand, being home alone and being a woman, strange men at the door and all that. But then... She looks at me furiously and says, are you fucking kidding me? And screams at me that you're ridiculous and I'm leaving. She turns back to her car, slams on the gas and screeches away out of the neighborhood. To this day, I have no idea who these people were and what they wanted or why she was so pissed about it all. All I know is that neither my husband or I called them and... They definitely don't work for the company they claim to. And now, we indeed do have a security system. So this happened when I was about 16 years old. My mum and dad were going out on a date night and asked me to watch my sisters. At this time, they were 13 and 10, and I watched them plenty of times before and had no issues, so I just thought that it would be like normal, watching movies and eating junk food and all that. But since they wouldn't be home till almost midnight, I brought in my dog just in case. She's a miniature pincer and is my guard dog. 
I found her abandoned when she was just a few weeks old and kept her since. Sadly, as she passed away last December. Anyways, everything was going fine until there was a knock at the door around 10pm. No one was supposed to be coming to the house, so I just decided to ignore it. However, the knocking persisted and a man's voice said to open up and that it was the police. I was very suspicious, especially since my dog's hair was standing on end. So, I sent my sisters to the basement where my room was located at the time and told them to just to stay quiet. I then told my 13-year-old sister to call the police if I didn't come and get them in 10 minutes. Once I locked the door to my room, I grabbed the gun my dad keeps in the house for safety and opened the door. My house has a screen door and then the main door and I only opened the main door and kept the chain on too. And standing there was a, a tall Caucasian male in a police uniform. Except the uniform, it just didn't look quite right. He started saying that he needed to search my house because they had got a tip about my house being a drug house. When I asked to see his badge and a search warrant, he came up with this story about it being in the car down the street. I said that unless I saw both those items, I was not opening the door. He started getting violent and banging in the screen door saying that I needed to open the door right now or I would be sorry. I told my dog attack in Latin and she immediately went into guard mode, putting herself in between me and the door and started barking at the fake officer. At this point, I yelled at my sisters to call the police now and slammed the door shut. I ran down to the basement and stood outside the room where I had my sisters guarding the door. I could hear the fake officer still yelling and now I could also hear him talking to other people. Multiple people must have been at my house at this point because I could now see multiple boots from the basement window. I had my sisters hide in the closet once I get confirmation that the police would be on their way and just waited in the room with the door locked. A few minutes later, and the actual police show up. I had my sisters stay put and looked around and a basement window was smashed in, but other than that, there was no damage. Three guys were arrested though and apparently they were using this ploy to break into people's houses. The real cops took my statement and soon after... My parents came home and they were worried sick.